Joe and I write in such different styles that I'm sure Joe's going to have his red pen out. Okay, we need to do that. Yes, yes. You can do it. Are we good to go? Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, I'm John Gregg. I'm the mayor of the town of Seabrook Island. We are convening town council today on the 29th of March, 2022 for a development standards ordinance workshop. Uh, we are being joined today, all members of council being present. Uh, we are being joined today by our consultant, Paul LeBlanc, as well as uh, the town administrator, our zoning administrator, and the town clerk. Uh, Catherine, I believe you will confirm that notice of this meeting was posted as is appropriate and that the other requirements of the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act have been satisfied. They have. Thank you for that. All of that being said, uh, we will proceed according to the agenda of which there is one item, review and discussion of draft development standards ordinance, which means the draft of the revised or proposed revised development standards ordinance. And uh, I will now call on the town administrator to get us started. Joe? Thank you, Mayor. Um, if you recall, the last time Council got together to uh, review and discuss the draft DSO, I think it was January 6th, um, it was a joint meeting with the Planning Commission. Um, at the time, the document was pending before uh, the Planning Commission for their review, comment, uh, and recommendation. Um, as uh, a requirement of state statute um, before we amend our zoning ordinance or our map it first has to go to uh, the planning commission for review and recommendation uh, the planning commission subsequently did uh, complete its review uh, of both the draft dso and uh, the proposed zoning map um, so that uh, document as it's been recommended by the planning commission is now uh, what is uh, before you uh, that does come with a uh, unanimous recommendation uh, in favor of approval. Um, <clears throat> this process actually predates a lot of your 10 years on council. Um, we started this process, I think it was back in 2019, uh, April of 2019, uh, when we entered into uh, a contract with uh, ELB planning group, um, Paul LeBlanc, who's here with us in uh, council chambers, uh, is the uh, principal and primary author uh, of the draft DSO. Uh, but around that same time, the council also um, created a, um, uh, an advisory committee um, that was made up of two members of our planning commission, two members of our board of zoning appeals. Uh, we had a member of town council, uh, who uh, formerly was Skip Crane before he packed up and moved away uh, towards the end of the process. But of course, the mayor, uh, even before he was mayor, also sat in on the majority uh, of those meetings as well and continued to uh, do so um, over his tenure, uh, including as mayor. Um, we had um, uh, Katrina, who's the ARC administrator for uh, the POA, was on our committee. Uh, we also had um, three uh, residents that were appointed at large. Um, those were Ed Williams, Roger Steele, uh, Gary Quigley. Um, our Board of Zoning Appeals members, we had uh, Walter Sewell and Wayne Billion. Um, we, uh, I'm sorry, Wayne was with the planning committee. We had Walter Sewell and Ava Kleinman. Uh, Ava rolled off Board of Zoning Appeals, but continued on 
um, as a member of the advisory committee. From Planning Commission, we had uh, Bob Driscoll, who was the former chair. He rolled off but stayed on uh, the committee, uh, as well as um, Wayne Billing. And of course, I and Paul participated in uh, all those meetings as well. We had uh, probably 20 some odd meetings over the course of uh, a couple of years. Um, we had a, a kickoff meeting very early in the process, hard to believe it's now been almost three years ago. Um, we also back in uh, August of last year, um, before the document was finalized and then taken before the, the committee and ultimately the planning commission, we did have a uh, kind of a, a public unveiling and a, a an opportunity for public review and comment and uh, had that meeting uh, at the end of August uh, last year. So at this point, this is now what we're calling the first reading draft of the DSO. Um, I expect between now and when we get to first reading, both as a result of today's meeting, um, and then we're also kind of at the same time going through um, over the next four weeks or so, we'll be looking and, and you know, making sure we don't have uh, any uh, erroneous information. Um, when you spend three years putting a document like this together, um, uh, I just pointed one item out to Paul. Um, you know, the one section where we dealt with the residential districts, I mean, that was one of the first sections we did probably two and a half years ago. Well, in the intervening time, we've had changes to our existing ordinance. And just for example, I, I noted one of the footnotes had uh, information that at the time was accurate, but now is no longer accurate. So we'll be going through and, and making sure we have everything you know, tight, accurate. Um, all the sections are pointing to the right numbers that um, over time, as we've amended the use tables and in, in different districts that we've also updated that same information to correspond uh, in the appendix, for example. Um, so that's something we'll be working on over the next couple of weeks. Um, but what we'd like to spend today talking about is, is hopefully focusing more so uh, on the big picture. Uh, we'll talk about anything uh, any of you want to talk about. If you have notes, questions or anything, um, that's what this meeting is for. We can go through uh, any anything in this document, uh, including stuff that's not in this document that you may want to see in the document. Um, ideally, we we try to, to stay focused on some of the, the bigger issues. Um, the, the biggest ones, in, in my opinion, are really the uh, zoning districts. Um, we had talked very early on and before the uh, committee um, started crafting its recommended language. Um, we brought to council a request to kind of scrap the old way of doing things in our, our current DSO, which was basically everything was part of a planned development zoning district. And, you know, we kind of have this one size fits all approach. Um, so, for example, we have one multifamily district. In our multifamily district, we had everything from condos to townhomes to cluster homes to single family homes. And it, it just didn't make any sense. And it resulted in, in having a lot of nonconformities um, all throughout the island uh, as a result of, of trying to make everything fit to this one district. Um, so one of the, the principal recommendations coming out of the draft DSO is that we basically scrap our old plan development districts and transition to a new um, district structure um, where we basically craft the districts to mirror what's in the field. So instead of having one multifamily district, uh, we now have three multifamily districts. So um, instead of trying to cram condos and townhomes and cluster homes, into one district, we now have a townhome district, we now have a cluster home district, and we have a true multifamily or, or condo type district, if you will. Um, on the residential side, um, we uh, have recommended um, having three single family districts, whereas right now we have uh, only one. 
Um, they're basically RSF1, SF2, SF3. Uh, RSF means residential single family. Um, one, two, and three is just kind of a, uh, a numbering mechanism where one is the largest lot, two is a medium sized lot, and three is a smaller lot. So when you look at areas like the village at Seabrook and Marsh, Embassy Road, whichever one that is, I think it's Marsh Point. Um, when you look at St. Christopher Oaks and some of these that right now are actually zoned multifamily, but when you go out there, they're single family homes on single family lots. It doesn't make any sense that they would have a multifamily zoning designation. Um, so we looked at that and we came up with a new district and called it RSF3, uh, which is our, our small lot single family district. Um, so that's really the what, what I would consider to be the, the big document is the transition of our, our zoning designations. Um, it's always been a, a thorn in my side every time someone asks what property is zoned today and you go and you look at our zoning map. And our zoning map has all these nice pretty colors and everything on it, single family, multifamily, and all these different districts. The issue is that's not actually what the property is zoned. Uh, the property zone plan development. Um, and uh, in a lot of instances, there's, there's confusion because you've had um, a, a plan development district that's been out there since I think 1971 um, is when the first concept came forward through the county for Seabrook Island, what ultimately became Seabrook Island. Um, so we're, we're trying to piecemeal 50 years worth of hodgepodge changes here and there to this, this PD. And it just, it just doesn't make any sense. So that's why we've recommended um, moving away from uh, the PD and having um, the standalone district. So that's, that's one that we definitely want to talk about today. Um, we'll go through, we have a um, zoning transition summary um, that we'll uh, review and discuss. Um, one of the other things I wanted to let you know, we had talked about uh, and funded in this year's budget, um, a new GIS program, um, which we just signed about a month ago, um, the contract. Um, we're now basically piggybacking off of the uh, Utility Commission's GIS contract. Um, they work with a company uh, out of Georgia called Brightspot. Um, they have some available capacity, seat capacity on there. Um, existing contracts, so they've allowed us to um, piggyback on theirs and, and take two of their uh, available seats. Um, and so we've been working with them over the last couple of weeks, and we now, for the first time ever, have a GIS layer with our proposed zoning map. So we can actually zoom in, we could look at individual parcels, we can do measurements, we can do all kinds of stuff uh, as we're going through having discussions today. Um, we do still have the um, PDF of the zoning map as well, um, but if we want to get in and look at individual parcels and, and things like that, zoom in, zoom out, we, we now have the uh, capacity to do that through um, uh, the right spot GIS system. Um, I think the other main focus that I'd, I'd like for us to kind of spend um, a bit of time on today is looking at the um, non-conforming um, uses section. Uh, that was, um, aside from the districts, the one that the, the committee probably um, spent the most time on. Um, <clears throat> because we've had this hodgepodge plan development zoning over you know, the last 40, 50 years, we have a lot of non-conformities. Um, and you know, some of it's just the rules have changed over time. Some of it, I, I think, looking at some of the decisions that were made, I think people may have just been confused about what the rules were in particular situations. Because we've had instances where, you know, one zoning administrator looked at it and interpreted it one way, and another one interpreted it a different way, and one of them kind of interpreted it multi different ways. So um, we have kind of this hodgepodge situation where um, you know, today we have a lot of non conformities. So um, 
a lot of the language that's in this draft document is um, looking at ways that we can kind of address those nonconformities, maybe create a little bit more um, flexibility. And one of the items that I think was such a high priority, it actually made it into our uh, comprehensive plan was trying to remove some of the obstacles um, that may otherwise prevent people from investing in, renovating, and rehabilitating property. Um, so in our current um, DSO right now, we have language that basically says, um, if you have a non-conforming structure, and it could be non-conforming in any number of ways. So uh, it may encroach into a front side or rear yard setback. Um, it may cover more of the lot than is allowed, might um, encroach into a marsh because marshes are dynamic, they change over time. Um, so it may be 20 years ago when it was built conformed with the marsh setback, but now maybe doesn't. Um, you know, we were looking at, at ways, how can we allow those properties to, to, to renovate, to be reinvested in, um, without triggering what our current ordinance requires. Our current ordinance says if you um, exceed 50% of that structure's value, then you have to bring the entire structure into conformity. So if your house was built in 1984, before the town even existed, um, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be encroaching on a setback line because the setback lines were different in 1984 than they are in 2022. Um, but if it's a 40-year-old house, it probably needs a little bit of updating, a little bit of work. Um, so if a current or a new owner comes in and they want to renovate it, um, you know, it's probably going to be pretty easy to exceed that 50% threshold. But what our current ordinance requires is that if you do, you have to bring it into conformity. So if that house is encroaching into a rear yard setback by 10 feet, you have to make a decision. You either have to lop 10 feet off the back of that house, you have to lift it up and move it 10 feet forward and drop it back down, you know, probably $75,000, $80,000 um, to do that, or you just don't do the upgrades. Um, so one of the things that the committee recommended was um, doing away with the 50% rule um, as it relates to um, major renovations. Um, so that's actually now um, completely taken out of this document um, and removing that barrier to, to the property owners, um, reinvesting, maintaining, fixing up, rehabilitating um, property. Um, We'll talk about it. I, in my opinion, there might be one area where I think this document might go a little bit too far, um, but we can we can discuss that um, when we get to it. So um, I do want to give Paul a couple minutes just to give you a little bit of um, uh, background to, I, I know you had a, a presentation from Paul back at the January meeting, um, very thorough presentation, kind of talking about uh, the whys and hows, but um, did just want to give him kind of a, uh, a couple minutes for a, a quick recap of, um, you know, some of the, some of his findings that he came across as uh, he was doing the update and, and you know, some of those major items that, um, you know, he may want to put forward for discussion today as well. Well, first of all, I would say that uh, working with the advisory committee was really helpful. I mean, it was a great group. It was um, a, a good represent, representative group of the community. They really took their responsibilities seriously. Um, we did have somewhere in the, the neighborhood of 20 meetings, um, which frankly is, is more than most communities have done, except in Fort Mill where I worked with uh, Joe, um, uh, maybe it's the South Carolina uh, approach to things, but um, it was not wasted time. They really looked at the document, they asked questions, they made suggestions, and uh, I, I think they can, uh, significantly contributed to uh, making this a, a, a much better document 
definitely focused on your community. And that's one of the things we started out with, as I mentioned before the meeting with someone, um, the original ordinance was apparently taken from a community in Florida where one of the council members had lived. And when the town was incorporated, uh, that individual said, well, you know, I, I've been on a planning commission and we, we have uh, an ordinance from the coastal community where I worked and uh, let's just start with that. And you can't do that. Every community is different. Even if it was another coastal community in South Carolina, philosophies are different, resources are different, uh, staffing levels are different. So you, you really have to tailor the ordinance to your community. And, and I'm confident that the draft that you have now uh, is definitely tailored to the town of Seabrook Island. So that's a big thing. One of the other things Joe mentioned, uh, converting from the, the plan development district approach to more conventional zoning districts. Um, as part of that, when I first looked at the zoning map and looked at the ordinance, uh, you had districts that uh, either uh, were not being used like industrial uh, and uh, and or maybe mislabeled. There were three agricultural districts. One of my first questions to Joe was, how much farming is going on on, on the island? And he said, well, there's really none. And I said, well, you've got three agricultural districts. Why is that? And again, that may have been a holdover from the Florida ordinance. Um, so we, we eliminated an industrial district. We eliminated uh, using the term agriculture. Um, we did tailor each of the districts to what exists on the ground. Uh, and in many cases, the goal was to, uh, if not totally eliminate, at least reduce, greatly reduce, the number of non-conforming conditions that, that Joe talked about a minute ago. So that the residential districts in particular are tailored to existing conditions in each of the neighborhoods. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't still some uh, individual structures that are non-conforming, but uh, we have managed to eliminate a lot of the non-conformity. So that was uh, a big uh, thing for us. The readability, uh, hopefully, uh, as soon as you pick up the document, you see that it looks a lot different than the current PSO. Uh, the format is different. We've reorganized so that things are, uh, things that relate to one another are uh, uh, with those items. Uh, we've added graphics, we've added tables uh, where possible. We've, uh, reduce the, the verbiage. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this for uh, several decades now, and there were some provisions in the current DSO that I read over and over and over again, trying to figure out what it was really saying. And that, that's what Joe was alluding to before, that uh, different zoning administrators or different planning commissions uh, could interpret some of the requirements very differently. So we tried to clean up those things and say specifically what, what we wanted to say. Um, we also looked for opportunities to um, cut some red tape, uh, allow more discretion or more review authority at the administrative level, rather than having things have to go to planning commission and or onto council for fairly minor items. Um, what else? Uh, we, we did have several instances that we ran across where our ordinance was in conflict with various provisions of state statutes. Right. That was one where we tried to, to 
pull them out and, and make them conform to. And there were several things we found where the ordinance was inconsistent with itself. Yeah. Where one section required this and another section required this. So uh, we tried to eliminate that and, and say what we really meant. Um, so it is very, very different. Uh, there are some provisions that we did take from the current ESO. That if they were working, if they made sense, we incorporated them here. Um, but uh, by and large, it's it's an entirely different code, and um, it's not to say that it's it's perfect. I think even after this extensive review, and by the time it gets adopted, um, I always recommend that you not rush to make changes for the first year. Uh, there will be things that you look at and say, well, I, why did we do that? Or, well, it doesn't work the way we expected it to work. Um, but give it time, work with it, and then at the end of a year, come back, and if you need to make some adjustments and, and fine tune it, then that's the time to do so. But I, I'm confident that it's going to work for the, the town much better than and current DSO does, which <laughs> we doesn't say a lot. Right. So before we jump into um, discussion of the, the districts and the district transition, are there any general questions or comments kind of on the process to date or how we got to where we are today? Joe, you touched on, I think it's important for this group as well as whoever else may be in our audience that uh, you will be addressing how the new revised ordinance addresses nonconformities. I think, it, as you said, uh, we are probably plagued with nonconformities throughout the town and when you bring in a new ordinance, uh, it is not the intent, nor would it be useful to suddenly force what's built to uh, be revised to bring it into conformity. So I think it's very important that that be uh, thoroughly explained. And there's, there is one other element in here that may be worthy of comment, and that is um, we do treat vested rights. And I, the reason I think that may be of interest to people is that it turns out, I think you will agree, that from the time someone gets a plan approved until they can actually get something built, there's a long passage of time. So, uh, I understand that the ordinance allows uh, almost de facto, I guess you could say, a two-year period for vested rights. And I think that is not overly generous for what we experience here in this community for people to get a residence built. I, I really have, there were other, no other points. I know that as you've already said, uh, there are probably some nits to pick in this uh, first first reading draft, and uh, any that I find, I will certainly share with you. But uh, other than that, I I did sit in on the advisory committee meeting, so I've heard from Paul, I heard from the members of the advisory group, and I've heard from uh, others who were attending those meetings and. And I believe, as Paul has already acknowledged, that that was a very beneficial undertaking to engage the community, have our residents take part in this work. And uh, you do hear some interesting uh, tales of what people are concerned about when they are considering specific provisions in a draft. And, uh, I think that, that was a very beneficial undertaking. So 
I applaud that effort. Yeah, just just talking kind of generally about the, the non-conformity sections. Um, what, one thing I do want to stress is the non-conformities that are out there today, we, I think, took great strides to make sure in preparing and hopefully adopting this ordinance that we were not creating new non-conformities. We were trying to make our ordinance more reflective of what's actually out there. So even like when you look in the residential sections, we actually have different requirements for lots that were recorded prior to adoption of this new document than we will for lots which may come into existence after adoption. And that's really a reflection of, you know, what's out there is there. You're really not gonna change it at this point, but for anything new that comes in after this document goes into effect, these are the new requirements um, for those lots. So <clears throat> when we talk about nonconformities, it's, it's not stuff that we're going to be making nonconformity. It's properties and structures um, that have been made nonconforming over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, a lot of them just by virtue of when they were built, they were built in the county and they were built under county zoning county procedures. And when the town incorporated in 1987, the council adopted its own zoning ordinance. So, I mean, right off the bat, I won't say everything, but probably a majority of what was built before 1987 most likely doesn't conform um, with the codes that we have in place today. Um, but in the intervening 35 years, there's been a lot of other changes that were made. Um, you know, one of them just to, to kind of pick on one, um, the, the council back in the early 2000s put an ordinance in that said, uh, if you create a, a new single family residential lot, it has to be a minimum of one acre. Well, if you have a lot that's under one acre, um, you know, it's going to limit what you can and can't do with that property. So, um, you know, there were just kind of these, and there was probably a reason why that was done. I, off the top of my head, don't know what it was, but I'm sure there had to have been a reason. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. Um, but, you know, something like that makes it very difficult for, for someone who, you know, maybe has an acre and a half. Mm -hmm. And under the old zoning ordinance, they could have subdivided that into, and maybe at one point it could have been two separate lots that were subsequently um, combined into one, and now they want to subdivide it back out. Um, the way our current ordinance is worded, if they can't put that line exactly where it was um, at the time it was combined, then they can't subdivide it. And this ordinance would give them a little bit more flexibility um, to, to do something like that, as long as both the lots meet the minimum square footage requirements and any existing structures meet the setback requirements, then they might have a little bit more flexibility than they would have um, under the current ordinance. Um, where we see a lot of the existing nonconformities is going to be um, in the multifamily um, sections. And that's why I think it's so beneficial that we went through and um, completely, for lack of a better term, threw out our old multifamily language and, and came up with these new multifamily districts. So we can kind of tailor them um, to what's actually out there, uh, instead of trying to have a one-size-fits-all approach to multifamily. Um, so, but I, I, I did just want to be on the record saying that this ordinance is intended to address nonconformities, not create new nonconformities. That's not to say there won't be one-off, you know, when you're talking thousands of pieces of property, you know, there likely will be some that are created here and there, but uh, on the whole, um, we were attempting to address nonconformities, not um, create new nonconformities. So any other general comments or questions before we start getting into the districts? Can we, can we start talking about individual issues that we might have or are we gonna to get to that or how do you proceed or perceive the agenda? There are a couple of things that I just wanted to bring up. 
if this is the time. Um, what, I guess, tell us what they are and then we'll see if it's okay. something we may cover as we're going through. The easiest one would probably be if you go to schedule table 5.2 schedule uses for residential districts, I see the words vacation club. In the climate that we find ourselves in with you know, short-term rental limits and things like that, vacation club is a red flag. And I see you have a footnote to go to section 9.4Q, which, excuse me, basically is the rent, you know, the, the rental ordinance that is in place, what you can and can't do and so on, but it doesn't really define what a vacation club is. We've all seen many letters coming from residents, you know, oh, we have vacation clubs, we've got LLCs, we've got this, we've got that, and so on. And I don't know if this having that not defined, because I can understand what a vacation club is from- Just, just to clarify, it is a defined term. It's in appendix A, page A13. Okay. And, and we didn't create anything new. We just took no. Uh, I understand existing language. But you, un you understand you know, what I'm saying is here there is nothing that says defined term or whatever or refer to that. People will look at this. This is only on page 34 of 207. My point is this: people will get through the first 34, 50 pages, and they're going to see that will be one of the first things they see, maybe not an asterisk next to it. My point is, just given that, um, uh, I would think that maybe we should have some sort of asterisk or maybe the defined term listed there, C definition. All you need to do is, and it says here, C section 9.4Q, you could add something like C definition, bum, bum, you know, whatever it is to bring people to that. I'm just, I, I think that's something we failed to acknowledge when we were doing our general discussion. That's something the committee actually recommended and, and is reflected in this document. Anytime you see a word in all caps, that's an indication that it is a defined term. Okay. So if there's a question about what that means, if you see it in all caps, that means you can go to Appendix A and you will be able to find a, a definition of what that word actually means. And that's fine. I mean, but you understand where I'm coming from. My other question or the other uh, issue I want to, and let me preface this by saying, I applaud the efforts made by the commission, by the groups that got together to put this together over an amount of time. I just can't even imagine the work done for this. So this is not a critique on them. This, I think they did a great, great effort and service to the community by putting this together. And they have taken care of a lot of the issues that the old uh, DSO uh, had and have taken care of that. That being said, my next or my other issue is the transition from the agricultural to residential. We can hold that one. We'll cover that when we get into the discussion of the districts. Okay. That's one of the ones we have okay. for discussion. Is there um, any, any others? No, not right now. <laughs> I don't know what the conversation will bring, but um, I reserve my right to jump in. <laughs> yeah, we can discuss and debate all those when we go through the, the individual districts. Uh, and that's one I, I, I assume we would have to say. Any other questions or general comments? All right, well, hearing none, we will go ahead and go straight into the district. So I'm going to try to throw them up on the screen here. I'm going to make the watching. <clears throat> So what I have up on the screen, um, this is what we call our zoning transition summary. 
Um, it's basically three columns. So on the far left hand side, um, you'll see um, our current zoning districts. And I use that term very loosely because uh, we can turn those if we need to. I use that term very loosely because in most instances, um, particularly on the residential side, when you see properly, property that's zoned single family or multifamily, that's not what the property is actually zoned. Um, I just use those because that's what's in our current map and kind of what people for the last 30 years have been looked at, uh, what uh, used to using to determine the zoning of a property. But I, I do want to clarify that in most instances, that's not actually what the property is zoned. That's just what's reflected on the map. Um, so uh, the left is the current. The center column um, is what we call our proposed zoning district. So those are the districts that we have um, in the new draft DSO. And then on the right hand side, just to kind of give you a little bit of context, and you know, we can go back and forth between this document and the map. Um, but when we are talking about like what is a cluster home community. Um, you know, we put on here, these are the ones that are actually proposed to be rezoned as cluster homes. These are townhomes, these are multifamily, these are the, uh, the small lot single family. Just to give you a little bit of uh, understanding as to, you know, why we classified one as one district and not another. Um, so we have these, so that's going from left to right. From, Top to bottom, we broke these out into a couple different categories. So starting at the very top, the, the green ones, um, we have what we call our conservation and recreation districts. Um, the second one down is the residential districts. Um, the third is the support districts. And that's just kind of a, a catch-all term for the everything else, basically. Um, mixed use is a new one, so we don't have anything currently on the books. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and then overlay is also new, so that's not something that we currently have on the books. Um, <clears throat> so we'll get started, uh, and these are basically shown um, in terms of intensity of use. So basically, when we start at the top, those are going to be the least intense uses, the least density. Um, so they're going from least the most as we go down this list. <clears throat> so in our current ordinance, we have, um, and Paul mentioned, we have three agricultural districts. Of course, aside from the community garden, there's no farming or true agricultural use anywhere on the island that, that I'm aware of, except maybe timber. I don't know if there's any timber harvesting that goes on here from time to time, but that's something that, that will usually be classified as an agricultural use. Um, so right now we have uh, the, the one that we have on here is agricultural conservation. Um, so basically this is one um, when there's uh, lots that are acquired by green space conservancy. That's the most common one. Um, they'll typically acquire those properties, they uh, extinguish any development rights by way of a conservation easement. Um, generally, they'll transfer those to the property owners association, and then the POA will request a rezoning. Um, once you've extinguished the development rights, you don't really need to rezone the property, but it is a, an additional layer of protection on top of that property, um, just so that our zoning also reflects the conservation status um, of that property. So right now it's AGC, Agricultural Conservation. Um, in the new district, we basically removed the agricultural from it because they're not used for an agricultural purpose. It's just a conservation might have very limited recreational um, uses, but it's intended really for a conservation green space type property. So the new district is CP, which is the conservation, uh, I don't remember what P is, P preservation, um, conservation and, and preservation. Um, when we look at how um, that is intended to be mapped on the new zoning map, um, Basically, any lots that are 
uh, owned by green space or were acquired by green space and subsequently transferred to the POA. Um, we have POA owned common areas and open space lots. So a lot of times when you've seen like a new uh, subdivision that was developed, there might be a 20 foot perimeter buffer that goes around it to buffer it from neighboring residential. You'll never be able to build anything in that buffer. Um, so on those, we've recommended that those be transitioned to conservation. Um, we have areas around um, like stormwater retention ponds and, and other ponds, um, really not developable. So we've recommended that those go um, to conservation. Um, and then we've also put in any um, undevelopable marsh lot. So I'll pull up on um, the GIS screen. Um, you'll see there's several pretty good sized properties, um, particularly along um, the, the creek here. Um, those are actually, they have a tax map number, but there's no high ground, there's nothing developable. Uh, on that property. So uh, there's a couple like surrounding landfall way um, up in this area. And then um, there's some down, uh, let's see, this is Captain Sam and Marsh, Haven, Marsh, Haven, Marsh, Haven, Marsh Haven surrounding Deer Point. Um, again, that's actually a platted lot, but it's all marsh. So um, you, know, you have to attach some zoning designation mm -hmm. to it. So if it's a platted lot um, and it's marsh, we, we put those as conservation as well. Um, and then you can just kind of see like some of the little one-off parcels. So there's common open space, um, like up at Jenkins Point, there's some ponds and whatnot. Um, so all those are showing up um, and then down in this area, you have some ponds like Old Oak Walk, um, Old Forest, um, around Mallard Lake. Um, you know, those are ponds. Nobody's going to go building houses in the middle of a, uh, of a pond. So we've recommended that all those kind of remnant pieces or, or open space lots would all transition to the, um, the conservation district. Any so question? It, so it looks like you took the horse trail and made it into uh, the yeah, that, that horse one. trail, I believe it is. In, yeah, in between um, Captain Sam's and the horse trail. Yeah, horse yeah. trail. Yeah. Okay. It looks like it's maybe missing from one of them. Yeah, I yeah, mean. Yeah, that's a pond. That's a pond. Yeah, right there. Is a, in between. Um, uh, Lob Lolly and Seabrook on the Road, they were that kind of strange. The one between trail. Captain Sims yeah. and Old Drake. Yeah, that's all. That's a pond. That's either a horse trail or a pond. Uh, that's a pond right that's there. That's a pond there, and the horse trail is to the left. Yeah, I think since this one is not shaded, there's probably not a parcel attached to it. Okay. Um, so I don't know what the status of that one is. But if there's not a parcel, they haven't applied a zoning designation to it because there's no parcel to attach the zoning designation. When you say not a parcel attached to it, there's houses all along there. Around it, those are all parcels, but the one where this pond actually sits, there's not a recorded parcel that is has an owner of record. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So I mean, um, they just flow, the whole thing just flows into one. But Jill, if this has to have a parcel attached to it. This is the horse trail. That's the horse, yeah. yeah right there. So I'm just pointing it out. Well, this is pulled from county records. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, so no one knows that piece of property. Don't let the there, there are people couple, backing up to it. No, there, no. There's a couple of you, like all this green down over here. You're like, yeah. why is that a parcel? That's all marsh. Mm -hmm. But there is an actual tax record and there's ownership attached to it. Um, so wow. that particular one is actually owned by the POA. Um, so you would say, well, why is this one a parcel? And you look at the one with the pond and it's, yeah. it's not. So I can't really explain what that is, but that's the data that we pull from the county records, okay. county tax records. 
Um, so that that pretty much cover, and of course you see kind of um, all around the island, you know, individual single family um, lots. Those are ones that were uh, acquired by green space and transferred over mm -hmm. to, uh, I think with maybe one or two exceptions, transferred over to uh, the POA um, for ownership. There are a couple pieces of property where there is a little bit of high ground. Um, I know there's one, And that one's owned by the Kiowa Island Natural Habitat Conservancy. So again, another uh, conservation entity. Um, so that's why we, we made that one, um, the, the conservation district. Um, and then there's one over here, which is actually owned by Hollower Creek. Um, there's a, a little island, um, but if you take the zoning layer off, there's really not any usable um, property. So um, we recommended that one go to CP as well. Um, but that's just kind of a general overview of the, the, the CP conservation district. Uh, are there any questions before we move forward to the next? All right, Joe, just go back to that one and then I just saw something that the one basically directly across the street from Town Hall, that's not in the town, correct? Uh, this one? Yes, or is it? No, it is in the town. Is it why is there a reason why it's multifamily and not single family or because it's zone multifamily right now? It is multifamily. Okay. All right. Understand. Yeah, that's um, Hallover Creek. It's about 14 and a half acres. Right. Um, yeah. Nice. Right across from Town Hall. Nice to get that condition locked into a conservancy or something. You got the money, I'm sure to sell. I hear you. I, I would agree with that, but until it is, there's no basis. No, I understand. No, I, I fully understand. I'm just thinking that way. Uh, any other questions on the conservation? Here are none. We'll move ahead to. We don't have any say. The, the next one is kind of another oddity in our current DSO. Um, within the Seabrook Island. PUD, there's something called a Parks and Recreation Subdistrict. So it's technically not a district, um, but it's mapped as if it was. Um, the Parks and Recreation District basically covers um, the, uh, the golf course, uh, it covers the tennis facilities, it covers the lake house, the community center, basically recreational um, facilities within the island. So um, in the new um, the new DSO, we just simply call it the recreation district. It will be a standalone mapped district. And within that district, we will apply that to uh, the club facilities. So the beach club, the golf club, the equestrian center, the racket club, um, the POA recreational facilities, uh, including the boardwalks, boat ramp, community center, community garden, crabbing dock, and the lake house. So when we switch over to the map, we're now going to this medium green type color. Um, so here you have the equestrian center. Next to the equestrian center, I went back and forth uh, in a prior version because this is actually a green space um, yeah. property that was acquired by green space. I think it's owned by POA now, but it's leased to the equestrian center for equestrian use. So that's kind of the one oddball where it's a conservation property that I don't have zoned for conservation because it's being used as more of an active recreational uh, use tied to the equestrian center. Um, but we have the, um, uh, the tennis club, the tennis courts, the lake house, um, the golf course is all recreation. Um, we have uh, over on Oyster Catcher, the community center and pool. Um, but uh, the, the majority of it is, is at least uh, land-wise is the golf course. Now, for the most part, um, 
our new map will just transition from what was on the old map. But I, there are a few parcels that I'll point out as we're going through that we've actually recommended rezoning them from one district to another. Um, so right now, currently, the our, our parks and recreation subdistrict allows the park and recreational amenities. Um, but in the new DSO, we actually include accessory to the parks, um, things like the clubhouse. And if you have a restaurant there, it's basically considered as if it's part of the golf club. Whereas right now that property is actually zoned um, commercial. And it's the only property behind the gate that's zoned commercial. And just from a strict zoning standpoint, the risk you take when you look at what a property is zoned is you're allowing anything that's allowed in that zoning district to take place on that property once you zone it. So if you zone property commercial, you know, right now it could be a, a, you know, a club amenity or something like a restaurant, but at some point you could end up with something that you may not necessarily want there. Um, so our commercial district allows basically anything that's commercial in nature. And that may, that may not necessarily be the type of commercial you would want in this particular location. So since we've changed the permitted uses in our recreation district, we actually included the clubhouse and the beach club, which right now are zone commercial. We've recommended that those go to recreation because they're under common ownership and they're tied to you know, the club, the club facilities and the golf course. So we now allow like accessory meeting space, we allow accessory restaurants, uh, accessory retail. So it's okay to have a golf pro shop at a golf club. You know, it's okay to have a banquet facility at a clubhouse. It's okay to have a restaurant at a clubhouse. We don't need to, at that point, zone that property commercial in order to accommodate that. We could accommodate it within the um, within the, um, the recreation district. So those two properties we've actually recommended rezoning from uh, commercial to uh, recreation to, to match the rest of the club property. So Joe, I have a question. Mm -hmm. If the club was changing some of the amenities of the island house, or adding something over at the terrace building beside the pool and just say, you know, hypothetically, they wanted to put in a small spa. Now, is that commercial or would that fall under their recreational amenities? I mean, because those are some of the discussions. Would that like prohibit them from putting a spa in? So what you would do is you would look at the permitted use table, uh -huh. um, which is in um, it's on page four dash one, okay. um, and that basically shows what's allowed. And now th these are the recreational and conservation ones. So the middle one is RC. That's the recreation district. And let me see if I can zoom in here a little bit so you can see. So if, you look, if you're talking uh, a health spa and a fitness club, those are expressly, P means it's permitted by the okay. way. Um, so in the RC district, you would basically just go down this middle column and anything where you see a P, it's permitted by right. They can do it, they just have to you know, get a permit, we can sign off on it, they're good to go. Um, so accessory uses and structures, um, erosion control, community gardens, wildlife refuge. Um, jumping down equestrian facilities, fitness clubs and health spas, um, golf course, country club, including accessory uses such as maintenance, pro shops, lounges, banquet facilities and restaurants. So that's where we kind of expanded what's included in a, in a country club. Um, it allows greenways, boardwalks, pathways, gymnasium, indoor recreation. Now, when you get to Marina, there's a C and that just means it's conditional. So it's allowed, but you'd have to go to section 9.4H to find out, you know, are there other conditions and will this property satisfy those conditions? As long as it does, then it's permitted. If it doesn't, then it would not be able to go in that location. Um, so we also have open air recreation, uh, utility substations, and, and kind of a generic similar use provision. 
Um, so it's it's still pretty broad, um, but it it takes out other things that would be allowed if it stayed commercial. Uh -huh. um, so indoor recreational uses was up there, mm -hmm. and I just know like this came out of a focus group. People were recommending a bowling alley. Would that be? <coughs> I mean, it's, I don't want yeah, to say I mean, it's a joke, but it came out of a focus group because people had been other places where there was a bowling alley. Would that be an indoor recreational? Typically the way I would do it, and I'll yield to our new zoning administrator, but as the former zoning administrator, if there's something that's a more specific description, we would start with that. So if there's uh, a use category for bowling alley, mm -hmm. we would see as bowling alley specifically permitted in one particular district. If it is, then we'd say it's only allowed in that district. If it's not, then we would kind of take a broader approach and say, well, which one of these most closely aligns mm -hmm. to a bowling alley? And I, off the top of my head, I don't remember if we call out bowling alley specifically or not, but if we didn't, then you know, I would say to me that's an indoor recreational okay. use, and then you know we would make a determination, and you know as long as that use is allowed in this district, it would be allowed. Okay, and I don't want this to sound like the club's putting in a bowling alley. I'm just saying that <laughs> I know that there was that discussion in a focus group. So as a follow-up, then the zoning has the um, real estate office is commercial right now, right? outside the gate there. What yes. happens if the club tears down that and that becomes recreational or another restaurant or whatever? Will that be allowed? Would they have to ask for the zoning? Um, it is on um, this map proposed. It's currently commercial uh, outside of the gate. What, what we were trying to do was take commercial, keep it outside of the gate. Right. Okay. In my opinion, really we're commercial. Okay. Now, granted, there's a limited amount of commercial that's tied to the country club, basically. Um, but the area outside of the gate um, is currently commercial and would stay commercial. So kind of similar to, to what we just did with the other one, we would look at and say, um, you know, we go down to the commercial and support districts. If that's zoned uh, LC, which is limited commercial, Basically, anything that's permitted um, in the LC um, district would be allowed by right. Uh, again, if it had a C, it's allowed, but there might be a, a additional conditions attached mm -hmm. to it. So like if you look, some of them it re references a section that's a conditional use section. So you may see things like it's allowed, but you have to have a, a larger lot size, mm -hmm. or it's allowed, but it may require additional screening, or um, you know it's allowed, but there's some other limitation that only applies to that particular use. Um, if you look at the one before, really the only limitation um, is uh, um, like in commercial, you can have drive-in and drive-through facilities for ATMs, banks, and pharmacies. But the only condition, it's labeled as conditional, the only condition is you can't have a drive through restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, so, but basically anything that's listed as a, a P or a C could potentially uh, be located um, at the, the. What if they the, wanted to put a swimming pool in there? Uh, I don't remember if we have. Most likely have to be rezoned to a recreational use, mm -hmm. um, unless the swimming pool was accessory to some commercial use. Now there are actually commercial swimming facilities. So if it were in, I mean, there was one where I came from in Fort Mill. It was like a a swimming. It was a pool where people went for swimming lessons, mm -hmm. and like you know could go have membership, whatever, and, and open to the public. And um, so that would be a commercial entity. Um, but I mean, so it, it would kind of depend on what it was and how it operated. But like if it was a swimming pool, like the beach club or something like that, uh, I don't think we have just straight up recreational facilities permitted by right. So um, this is my thinking though. We're, you know, we're up against all this 
short term rental whose comments about the stress on the island's amenities mm -hmm. and making sure Sapoa and the club can expand and accommodate um, the island being built out in the full growth. So, do we want to inhibit the club from being able to expand on their property? Well, wouldn't they be able? They purchased a piece of property, but I'm assuming they do. They own it now. It's the real estate office. Okay. And but then that may not stay the real estate office. I mean, can they just stuff in the apply air. to have it rezoned? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. They could. <laughs> yeah. If they were doing like a pool with yeah. a restaurant attached or something. Well, like they, could they could have a restaurant, but again, this is just a big if. <laughs> if they wanted to put a recreational facility in there, like um, a golf simulation coming in and hitting golf balls and stuff. Um, I don't think we want to, as long as they can come in and ask for rezoning, I don't think we want to prohibit Sapoa or the club from being able to expand the amenities that seem to be one of the big gripes on the island that they're being overwhelmed and we need to look long range that the amenities keep up with our population at build out. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really going to depend on the nature of what it is. So uh -huh. if it's, you know, just a club amenity that's only available to members and their guests, then it's not really a commercial okay. use. Um, so I, I would think in that case, it probably would have to be rezoned. The other thing you want to take into account is just how little commercial property you have right. zoned in the town. And half of our budget comes from business licensing. So I'm not picking on any one particular mm -hmm. property or property owner. We start eating away at that very limited amount of commercial available mm -hmm. property that we have. It's almost like we're shooting ourselves in the mm -hmm. foot because that's how we pay our bills mm -hmm. <laughs> is with business license. Right. So if we take that away, um, then that's likely going to be commercial revenue that we're going to have to make up somewhere else. So the club has the club operates with a business license, though, right? Um, I don't know if they have one for everything. I know certain things they do, but because I would just would think it would thing. just increase the cost of their business license if they added, you know, the revenue. I would just say from a zoning standpoint, I wouldn't want to take away like just as property owner without, you know, I mean, they have the capacity, like, it's a lot easier to downgrade mm -hmm. zoning, going from a commercial mm -hmm. use to a recreational use. So I wouldn't want to make any big moves without anything being definitive, but from a zoning standpoint, I don't view that as anything that would be too contentious okay. to take a property that's currently owned by the club. And, mm -hmm or by the PO in and down zone it essentially right. to just that recreational use. Okay. It, it, like would, I said, it would be the opposite of like if the right. POA came in and said we want to rezone the lake house for a you know commercial strip mall right. or something. Could you imagine the pitchforks yes. and the outcry? Um, I think that's a great point because at that point you are down zoning mm -hmm. from a more intense to a less intense. Yeah, like I said, I just don't want to hamstring Sapoa are the club. I'm not picking one or the other from it, it would essentially be expanding they just need to keep amenities. us in the loop. And yeah. as long as they plan that out far mm -hmm. enough out and from a timing standpoint, you know, we could get that to where that's not okay. anything that would hinder their capacity to do that. And okay. and the other thing is we could very easily just under you know services or something put a commercial recreational. Um, you know, so as long as it's something that's being operated. Do we have commercial a, business? We had other commercial services as uh, as a zoning as, or as a use in in Hilton Head that was kind of a all encompassing. Yeah, I don't think we have um, in all the districts. We've added a similar use item mm -hmm. um, because. We will never be able to list every conceivable use right. that might be legitimately allowed uh -huh. in the district. So the similar use provision allows the zoning administrator to interpret 
based on criteria in the ordinance, whether the proposed use is not listed, but is similar in nature to other uses that are listed and then allow it. Okay. So if, if we added like an indoor commercial recreational use in this district, I think it would probably address what you're saying. Um, you know, because that would even be using your bowling alley yeah. example. Yeah. Bowling, kind of yeah. bowling alley and indoor or laser tag. I mean, there's our, our you could probably the yeah. golf thing. Yeah. The only thing it wouldn't address would be if um, for like a pool or something. But well, yeah, if it would, that could. I mean, it could also there's also I'm just tossing. I mean, we had both indoor and outdoor commercial recreation. The, the thing that scares me about outdoor recreation is lighting. Right. Yeah, then you can end up with like a club of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you're going to do it, I would do like an indoor commercial recreation. I mean, I, I you know, in your expertise in all of this, like I said, I just don't want to hamstring any of our entities from improving and expanding the amenities as the island is built out. So whatever you guys think might catch that so we don't do that, or if you think it's okay as is, I just kind of have that insurance on the record. How much do we know something's gonna change there? <laughs> I cannot speak for the club, but I guessing something pretty major is gonna change there. Just knowing that the building has to either have major renovations or be to come down and start all over again. Because right. the club, I mean, this is not good, but the club actually purchased a building on Rental Way that will stay commercial for office, real estate, something probably. But in theory, it could also, they may be coming to do recreational over there. So something's going to happen between the real estate building and the building they bought on Landfall Way. So and I think in June, they're, they hope to announce some of that. But there's going to be some cha major changes over there. Well, one other argument against rezoning it to recreation is if you change it, then everything that's there becomes non-conforming. Well, then so the they're, other real they're estate office is They're using it as a real estate office. And I, I would imagine they don't want to make their existing use non-conforming. Right. So if, if you think we're good that they can come in and conditionally down, well, down that or, I mean, to me, it, it seems reasonable. If it was a commercial and I would just qualify an indoor recreational use, uh, I think that's a to concern. me, that's consistent yeah. with, you know, what's allowed in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the commercial mm -hmm. district. And I don't know if Sapoa has any concerns along here. They're, that's all outside the gate, so. So that, I mean, that, I would think the answer to that is if an indoor commercial recreation could be added, and then if it were the case that the route that was taken was that it was going to be in an outdoor pool, and it would just be for that one specific instance, then that route would likely have to be a rezoning okay. recreation. All right, just so but that the there's indoor commercial avenues, recreation yeah. encompass all those yeah. other aspects that you talked about. Yeah, so, okay. just so there's an avenue for both of those entities to Look at stuff. Can you please ask them to contact me before <laughs> putting a bowling <laughs> before getting too no, far in the for a bowling alley. <laughs> I, am, I am not speaking for the club. I just know that there's ideas and discussions floating around out there and, and some planning trying to take place. So, but I'll pass that on. <laughs> um. So, I mean, by and large, I think as, as far as the RC, the recreation district, pretty self-explanatory, yeah. um, you know, what's, what's being <clears throat> switched over to, um, to, to RC. Um, one of the things I will point out, because you do see a bunch of these on the golf course, there's a lot of these little squares that I think under our current map had some other zoning. Um, what we've reckoned, and these are mostly like pump station and you know, utility locations. 
So you'll see a lot of these you know, little squares here and there all over the place, uh, which are actually sitting on separate um, parcels, tax ID numbers. Um, so this one here is owned by the club. Uh, this one over here is owned by the POA. We just recommended that they essentially be an extension of what property is surrounding them. So the ones that are on, uh, on or adjacent to the golf course will be recreation. Ones that are adjacent to residential areas will be residential. So, um, you know, when you see just these tiny little, little, you know, squares here and there all over the place, that's, that's what those are, like pump stations and uh, little you know, utility um, stations. You got a little one over here at the camp. Uh, and these are just tiny little one-off. So this one's uh, like, what is that? Eight one thousand mm -hmm. per an acre. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, and it's, it's owned by the town because it's a uh, utility uh, utility substation. So just when you see those, we've just recommended that they be zoned whatever the uh, surrounding property is. Uh, any other questions on the recreation district? Is the utility use allowed in the I think we put them in where they're allowed at pretty much everything. Uh, utilities, substations, and substations. Jump back to the zoning transition summary. Um, <clears throat> under our, so the third one down, under our current um, DSO, we have, I scratch my head every time I look at it. We have a planned development district for the camp, but there's really not any language attached to it. <laughs> Just basically says it's its own separate district and it allows a couple of things and that's about it. Um, what we've recommended is we just do away as we will with all of our um, planned development districts. So the agricultural camp district goes away and it would be replaced by a new district called the Camp St. Christopher district. It's only gonna apply on the camp property. Um, and you can see it on the, um, on the map in dark green. almost 230 acres um, and it just runs, um, it only applies to the camp property, the, uh, the little uh, uh, utility substation property that sits kind of in the middle of it. The, there was a lot of discussion when we, when we reviewed this with the, um, uh, with the committee, um, there was concern about, you know, what happens if the camp is ever not there? What happens to that property? Um, so we do have um, a list of permitted use in the camp. Um, so we have accessory or conservation type stuff, erosion, gardens, wildlife refuge. Uh, it allows classroom and lecture facilities, dormitories, and Cabins for campers, staff, and conference attendees, but not including um, for-profit hotels, campgrounds, or other lodging. Uh, it allows equestrian facilities, um, greenways, boardwalks, non-motorized pathways, gymnasium and indoor recreation, open-air recreation, uh, cemetery, places of public worship. Um, put that in because it is a religious-based um, facility. Mm -hmm. Um, utility substations, wireless communication, and similar uses. So that's all that's allowed on the camp property. Um, if something ever did happen to the camp, and we're not saying it, it will, but if, if at some point something happened to it, um, you know, they try to sell the property, whatever, the only thing that could be out there is those items that I just listed. So if somebody wanted to do, um, a golf course, if somebody wanted to do um, a, a neighborhood, residential, multifamily, whatever, they would have to come through and reason uh, the property for that purpose. So um, that was one item that, that the committee was 
um, very adamant about was, was protecting the integrity of the camp. And of course, if, if it ever did go away and somebody wanted to do something different with that um, 200 plus acre piece of property, it would have to come in and be rezoned, which is a public process. It's two readings, it's a public hearing. Um, you know, people would have an opportunity to uh, come out and speak in favor or in opposition uh, before that zoning designation ever changed. Any comments about the camp property? Back to the list. Uh, and then one I assume we'll have discussion about, and, and Dan will let you chime in here the um, agricultural um, general district. Um, that was one that uh, we, as staff and the consultant, felt um, without having any agricultural use, um, or as far as I'm aware, any demand for agriculture. Um, not having a need for a general agricultural district, um, especially when we went in and looked at some of the things that are actually allowed uh, in our current um, agricultural district. So it would allow things that you know most people wouldn't consider very uh, obnoxious, like farming crops and those type things. But uh, it would also allow um, livestock. Um, Actually, I say crops aren't that offensive, but um, if you've ever been in an area when they fertilize, um, and a lot of times they use like animal waste mm -hmm. for fertilization, it is not pleasant and you don't want to be just talking from personal experience within five miles of it. Um, the livestock, um, of course, livestock do what livestock do. Um, don't necessarily know that that's the type of thing that we would want when we look at the, the areas that right now are zoned agricultural general, primarily surrounded by marsh. Um, you know, when you think of livestock and runoff, not necessarily, in my opinion, the type of thing you'd want to put right next to a marsh um, just for runoff issues, animal waste has to go somewhere. Um, my preference would probably be not in the marsh. Um, but there's a lot of other things that are allowed in our agricultural district. So uh, recreational uses, um, you know, those properties, you could have athletic fields, outdoor recreation. Um, you can have public and private docks. Um, you know, I don't know if that one, if it's deep enough to get um, access to a dock there, but I mean, at least theoretically, um, you know, if you had access in the areas that are currently zoned agriculture, it could threaten the integrity of the gate. Uh, people could go in and, and dock and have access to uh, the island and, and by boat and bypass the gate. Um, you know, not knowing the depth and navigability of any of those channels, uh, I couldn't say that for certain, but a, a dock, public or private dock, is something that's currently allowed. Um, the current ordinance does not have any uh, height requirements or restrictions for agricultural structures. So if it was, if those areas were used for agricultural uses, um, you know, like I said, they're adjacent to a marsh, they're flood prone. So if you have to store uh, seed, crop, anything like that, it's going to have to be elevated. Um, you know, so maybe you're looking at grain elevators or, you know, high level storage or something that um, under our current ordinance, there is no height restriction. Um, so they could be as tall as somebody wants to put them. Um, the uh, Current ordinance also allows things, um, you know, agricultural structures, again, without height limitations So something like windmills um, would be permitted um, in that area. Um, so when we, we take all those things into consideration, one, just the general lack of demand or need for agricultural use, the, um, the other items that are allowed there, um, just how limited space is actually available for agricultural currently. It's about 60 acres. Um, the um, 
opinion from us as staff and the consultant was that there was not a need for an agricultural district. Um, so that was kind of step one. Step two was if we don't have an agricultural district, you have to zone it something. Um, we of course would look at the, uh, the conservation and recreation districts. Um, conservation, to me, that's something you really only want to apply for a lot that's not developable for one reason or another, whether it's a conservation easement or, you know, it's too small, too narrow, it's a buffer, it's a wetland or, or marsh. So if you zoned it conservation, there's probably a, a good argument to be made that you've taken away all economic value of the property without any sort of compensation to the owner. Uh, if you make it recreation, now you're allowing things that people may not necessarily want in their backyard, um, you know, outdoor athletic fields with lighting and those type things. Um, Camp St. Christopher, obviously, is not part of the camp, so we didn't look at that one. So kind of the next least dense, least intense use was the um, RSF1, um, which is the lowest density uh, single family district. So in putting the map together and, and looking at how we would map the districts, our recommendation and, and what's in the draft map that the um, Planning Commission endorsed was that the uh, areas that are currently zoned agricultural general switch over to RSF1, uh, which is the single family large lot district. Uh, within that district, um, there's a minimum lot size of one acre. Um, so, and that was not pulled randomly. Um, our current ordinance says basically if you have a residential lot that was created after sometime in 2000 some odd when that was put into place that a new residential lot would have to have a minimum of one acre. So we pulled that one acre minimum, um, attached it to SF1 and um, the recommendation for uh, agricultural general was to transition it to the uh, single family one, which is the one acre uh, minimum lot size. So when we look at the map, there's really only a couple parcels um, that are currently zoned agricultural general that um, we've recommended and planning commissions recommended uh, that they switch to RSF1. Uh, there's a couple islands out here, um, kind of way off of Jenkins Point, um, really not accessible, not developable without OCRM approval and also, you know, if you're doing anything to connect here, it's going to require variances and, you know, it's going to go through a, a whole public process before anything can happen um, to these properties out here. Um, this one's already under conservation easement, so that one um, will stay conservation. Um, there's three pieces over here, I think combined, these are about 30 acres, um, and these are the ones that back up to um, Jenkins Point. There's actually already a couple of single family zone pieces up adjacent to Jenkins Point that are actually not part of Jenkins Point. Those were just subdivided um, and, and set aside as, as separate single family lots. Um, as far as I know, they're, they're definitely not part of Jenkins Point, but I believe they're also not part of the POA um, either, is my understanding. Um, but adjacent to some of those, these are about 30 acres collectively. Um, the one furthest towards the bottom of the screen, that's all marsh. Um, if this was a separate parcel, it would be green because you can't build on it. Um, the middle part here, um, there is some high ground. I can take the zone layer off so you can kind of see the area that we're talking about. So down here is all marsh. The middle area, there is, there is buildable high ground. Um, the issue is going to be with access. Um, in order to get access, you would have to cross one or both of these areas. Um, issue we're going to run into is our, um, our setback requirements are basically going to preclude access to this property here because you would not be able to cut a road or something in and meet the setback requirements. 
So again, before this middle piece of property, if it were ever to develop, they have to come in, um, likely have to get some OCRM approvals, um, but also a variance, which would go through a you know, public review, public comment um, process. So really the only one that I would say is, is you know, today developable under R1 uh, would be the piece sitting up here. I think it's probably about 10, 12 acres or so. Um, so if we were looking at a minimum lot size of one acre, um, of course you have to, to take out some for you know, road mm -hmm. connectivity, for stormwater infrastructure. So I mean, at most on this piece, you might be looking at, Paul, what would you think? Seven, eight, probably tops yeah. Um, yeah. up over here. Um, again, this middle piece couldn't develop without a variance. And this bottom piece is all marsh. You can't develop it, period. Um, so this is probably the, the biggest one where you would potentially be impacted. Uh, of course, the owner of this property also lives right up here, I think, in one of these houses. So the biggest impact is, is going to be the property owner because it's right outside their front yard. Can I ask a question? Then? Sure. How many houses are allowed right now? What's Pardon the minimum? Me? Uh, and Thank agriculture, because uh, there is a minimum. absent of rezoning, the current I think is one per five acres. Okay, see, that's my concern, and that's I'm looking at it from strictly everything you said about agriculture and all that. I agree with 100%. I think we should change it. Point is that I like to approach this from as a point of conservation. As I said before in our, one of our last meetings, is I'm going to look at different things through a conservation lens. So basically what we're saying here is by changing it to the current RSF1, we're going from one dwelling unit per five acres to one dwelling unit per one acre, give or take. And I understand the buffers and roads and all that kind of stuff. So in other words, we're saying without all that other, there's 10 acres there, you're allowing 10 homes. If it's one per five acres, you're allowing two homes. And with all the building going on here, all the different things, if we can find any way to conserve and limit development, you know, we constantly talk about this property. I hope I'm pointing in the right direction over here that, we don't have any control of that was going to go from four units per acre to eight units and we were fighting in other words conservation and the environment are uppermost on people's minds and my suggestion is to yes uh, get rid of the agriculture but we can do something else and call it the RSF 1.5. And that minimum requirement is one dwelling unit per five acres. All those that uh, uh, are currently um, zoned agriculture just slide in there. They don't lose the ability to develop it because that doesn't change. It's one per five, one per five. That, uh, stays the same. Uh, if you want to number it some other way, I don't, you can keep the setbacks in there, all that kind of stuff. I just think it goes a long way to conserving property in an area that is, as we know, very dynamic. You have wetlands, uh, you have marshes, things like that. And we don't have to worry about OCRM coming in because that takes it out of our hands. This is a way we could keep it in our hands and limit the amount of growth out there. That's my perspective and looking at it from a conservation point of view. That's all I'm looking at it for. So the, uh, again, I mean, that is something you can do. You can create additional space. Um, right. The, the question I would probably raise, and we brought this up at the committee meeting, and I think we did at planning commission too, is all the property around there is residential. Um, minimum lot size of about a third of an acre, so 17,500 square feet, 
is the minimum lot size for basically all the residential surrounding it. Um, so if you go right, right now, just- But those were subdivided in an earlier time and you don't want to change it. We have, again, the control over this at this point to keep it the way it is. That's all I'm saying. It isn't, you know, the, the person wants to build on that 10 acres and put two houses on there, whatever, go for it. That's allowed. But yeah. all I'm saying is to make it part of the 10, you know, or 10 units or whatever, uh, one per acre, uh, just doesn't make sense to me from a conservation point of view. I'll, I'll let Paul chime in, but, but the, the thing that that concerns me is what is the rational basis for saying, well, can all around you basically three per acre is what's allowed. Now what's built there is larger than one, one third acre lots there. I think we measured them probably around seven tenths to seven and a half mm -hmm. tenths per acre. So they're larger than what's required in that district, but what's allowed in that area is about a third of an acre lot. So to me, you'd want to justify a rational basis for why right next door, you can have three per acre and one per five acres. So what's the rational basis for saying this one, you know, you need a 15 times larger lot than that one. Well, I, my, again, I'm, those parcels that you're looking to before, were subdivided at an earlier time. And for whatever reason, these weren't. And I understand what you're saying. So let's say that they want to do that. Um, I'm, I'm saying right now, absent a um, request from the owner to change it, maybe the owner comes to us and instead of saying, um, one unit per five acres, he says, ah, let's make it one unit per two acres and I'll give you uh, an acre or two at the end for a nice little park. I don't know, that's part of the negotiations. My point is keeping it the way it is and an absent and urgent need at this point, I would say keep the density the way it is until a future time when a development proposal comes to us and then we can rezone accordingly or whatever. My point is, if we change it to one per acre, we're closing that door. It's just like Tyler, I believe. Tyler says, it's easier for us to go from large lots to maybe smaller lots than it is if we go from smaller lots and we say, oh boy, we, you know, we now don't have that uh, acres anymore and want to make them bigger. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Once we make them small, that, that uh, door is closed. I'm saying keep it the way it is at one per five, then in a future time, whether it's two years, three years, four years, whatever, maybe not, we then maybe consider it rezoning it or coming up with something else. Um, I, again, I am looking at it for just a, a point of conservation. There is a lot, not a lot of land on Seabrook Island that we have control over that is um, conservation land. And I'm not saying to call this conservation land, but if we could do anything to ensure a better environment, we should definitely uh, look at that because that's what the uh, people tell us they love about Seabrook is its environment, its forest, its everything. Um, that's, my, that's my question of why we can't do it do that. If I could just jump in. Yeah, um, please. I think Joe has pointed out that of 30 acres, only about 10 would even be developable. That a substantial portion of that area is wetland that can't be developed. 
Uh, another portion is marginal at best. What we looked at when creating the zoning districts and looking at zoning property is what is reasonable. Um, Joe alluded to this earlier that we can't deny somebody the use of their property. We even the, the wetlands and somebody owns that, so we can't zone it conservation. Uh, it's up to that owner to figure out what he wants to do with it, uh, which is probably not much. But where land is usable, the the town needs to make sure that we're providing a reasonable use of that land and not taking the value. From a planning standpoint, it's hard to justify taking that one 10 acre piece out of the entire town and zoning it something, creating a district just for that piece of property that is substantially different than all of the existing development around it. Granted, they were done many years ago, but the reality is that we have to look and a court is going to look at what is there now. And as a planner, and I do a lot of expert testimony in zoning litigation, as a planner, it's tough for me to look at that and say, well, you've got 15,000 square foot lots abutting the property and surrounding the property, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna hold to uh, one unit per five acres when the entire 10 is conceivably developable. And maybe it isn't, uh, but that's up to the owner to figure out if, if he can uh, support the cost of putting a road in there and utilities and, and doing all the other things that are necessary. Um, just, I, I would have a hard time supporting uh, a, a five acre minimum. Because under even the current ordinance, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it says something to the effect that I'm less developed as a PUD, uh, the lots have to be five acres. So conceivably, it could be like everything else in Seabrook, could be developed as a planned development on something much smaller than five uh, five acre lots. And, and that's basically what happened with Jenkins Point. It was pulled out in four separate phases over a period of 10 or 15 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. All that was zoned agricultural. And it was Jenkins Point, phase one, two, three, and four. And it was ultimately taken from agriculture, rezoned to single family. And most of the lots out there are under like I said, I think they average about seven tenths or so uh, of an acre. Um, but what our current ordinance allows is basically 17,500 square feet, which is roughly a third of an acre. Um, <clears throat> and again, that, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. It is in our hands to do what we feel is best for the overall community. Correct. It is one unit per five acres now. I would not even say, oh, let's make it one unit per 10 acres and, and take away. The understanding is right now that they can develop at one unit per 10 acres. And I, I hear what you're saying about the definition of being a, uh, an urban development, uh, you know, PUD. And, and that, all, that adds a, a little bit of a, uh, maybe a wrench into it. My point is simply apps and you know, the other thing is we say now that that other portion is um, undevelopable because OCRM would never approve it and all this kind of stuff. Uh, again, I don't wanna put our future development in the hands of somebody else if we can control it we should can control we should control it you know just by saying ah they'll never be able to get the permits stranger things have happened i've only been here 10 years and i've seen things that ocrm has approved and not approved and 
just you know blows my mind. That being said, we can control it right now. And if we do at a later date, based upon a proposal, and the you know, let's say two, three years, the owner comes and says, you know, uh, I want to do it for whatever reason, and I want to develop it in a similar type of way, uh, we can react accordingly then. It's not like the door is, but again, it's in our control. Once we say one unit per acre, we're basically saying, no, it's not in, you know, that's what it's going to be. And that's, uh, that's it. We can't go back. Uh, I don't, I haven't heard of any proposal. I haven't seen any proposals. All I'm saying is let's keep it under our control at what it is for developable land. So that's my piece. I'm only one person. So therefore, you know, I don't know how the rest of the council feels about this. But uh, that's just the point I wanted to make and, uh, and go from there. Could, could I throw this out just for discussion? Well, two, two things. One is if you went to a one per five acre, um, hearing what Paul says, that, that could be problematic. Would you tie that to basically restoring agricultural and then allowing them to maintain what they can currently do, which is agricultural use. No. no. Again, uh, you know, we're looking at hypothetical what ifs. You know, we're looking at what if they want to develop this? What if they want to sue us? What if they want to, you know, what's... what? What, what I'm saying is if you basically restore what's there currently. I'm not restoring it. I, I agree to take out the agricultural uses. Well, and what, all what those I, types of things. I'm I, looking at it from the development standard. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to address Paul's comment, if you restore what's there, you know, if they say, well, you know, one per five is not reasonable, you can go back and say, well, you have other, you know, legally authorized uses. So we're not taking away all economic value of the land. And if you want to farm it, go ahead and farm it. You just can't do more than five. Eight. I, I think that probably addresses Paul's concern, mm -hmm. just from the legality standpoint, is just restoring it to what it is today. Um, you know, will they farm it? Who knows? Probably not. I don't even know what their access rights are across the POA property and, and whatnot. But at the very least, that would restore any existing prior rights that they have currently, which I think could address a, you know any takings or unreasonable misclaims on the density side. But the other one I wanted to raise, you know, talking about Jenkins point is what, what's kind of been lost in all the discussion is Jenkins point itself, those are a lot larger lots than the minimum that's required. Jenkins point will go to, if this map is adopted, RSF2, which is what it is currently, 17,500 square foot minimum lot size. There are existing lots in Jenkins point that could be subdivided. And that's not anything that anybody's brought up. Um, you know, just looking eyeballing some here, there's several lots that are over an acre that could potentially be split into three lots. Um, so another question I would throw out, do you want to down zone Jenkins Point? Even if that means potentially making existing residences um, non-conforming, um, because that will take the ability to subdivide off the table. Um, and you know, if we're talking about density and those type of things, knowing that there are parcels out there, existing parcels that could be subdivided into two or three, that's something you may want to consider. But in doing so, it, it will make properties out there non-conforming. But on the flip side, if you do go to a lower density in Jenkins Point, I think it probably becomes a little bit easier to justify an even lower density where it becomes a little bit more transitional. So you go, you know, from Seabrook Island Road, which is 17,500 square foot lots to Jenkins Point, which is one acre minimum lots to, you know, this piece, which is five, two and a half, two, whatever the number is, it becomes a little bit more transitional. And I think could also make it a little bit more reasonable to, to justify having a lower density there too. But in doing that, I think you would have to 
impact the existing properties on Jenkins Point to, to make that argument. Going in, let's say we have uh, the, it seems like, what would you say, 1750? 1700. 17, yeah, 75 is the break even point. Well, that, that's the minimum lot size. Yeah. yeah. But what you're saying in taking a point, there are basically then two. Uh, is the zoning throughout Seabrook Island mixed? In other words, let's just say I have a lot that's current, currently um, 17, you know, the RSF2, and a couple few down, there's one that's RSF1. It's in my neighborhood, whatever. Is that indeed possible to have mixed use? For, for the most part, no. Um, the, well, the current ordinance we have, we have basically a conforming lot and a non-conforming lot. So basically anything that's over 17,500 square feet is considered a conforming lot. So when we transition the district, basically the, the default, the standard is 17,000. 500. Now, there's going to be lots that are larger than that. Sure. There's some that are going to be smaller than that. Um, but 17,500 is, is basically a continuation of what our default is, which is a, a conforming lot. Well, we, 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 you know, we, we don't currently have an RSF1 district. So I can't point to the map and say, well, there's some RSF1 over here and over here. The closest thing we have currently is there's a, well, I'll qualify this. There's a couple of properties up here at the end of Jenkins Point that were zoned agricultural residential. We don't have an agricultural residential district, but that's what these properties were zoned. So I don't really know what they are. Um, we just call them single family because we do have a standalone single family district, um, which is not part of a PUD. I think that was the intent, but that's not what the ordinance said. Um, so, I mean, looking at it, there's only a couple properties up here, which are just straight up single family residential. Uh, everything else is just a single family lot with a 17,500 square foot minimum. Um, now, like looking at this one over here on Jenkins Lagoon, this one's 1.3 acres. You know, 17,500, which is the minimum lot size in RSF2, Somebody can buy that lot and turn it into three lots. So, I mean, if, if that's a concern, then we may want to look not just at, you know, this property at the end, but also Jenkins Point, because mm -hmm. that's really the only area where we have large single family home sites, you know, that are out there that, I mean, there's other single family home sites, but that's really the only area where we have larger single family home sites where you could feasibly subdivide them into smaller lots. They wanted to subdivide, Joe. Do they have to come to planning commission and put that request in? Yeah, well, so, yeah, most likely. So well, in no, theory, under, they could be turned down, right? Yeah, it depends on how many lots. If it's a minor subdivision, no. Okay. But if it meets all the requirements, there's no basis not to approve it. There's, okay, so, all right. So if the minimum lot size is 17,500 square feet, and with this one technically you can get um, 3.27. Of course, again, you can't get 0.27 of a lot, so you would round down. And this one in particular, not to pick on any one person or anything, but that one could be under what's proposed in this ordinance could become three lots. And Jim, one thing I wanted to circle back to is what you were saying earlier is if they did go to develop that in the hypothetical scenario that OCRM let people build houses in critical area, which I really don't see happening in my experience, but not, not house. Um, yeah, we got 10 going up on the spit, but that's another. But, but so <laughs> the point being though, is that if they came through with that, we still have sections of our development standards ordinance that they would have to adhere to that speaks to that OCR and critical line 
and the corresponding setback that you can't be in. And the only exceptions that I think that allow for those outside agency approvals to just straight up over to, to basically cover the approval is for docks and, and things like that that OCRM really does have purview over. Sure. So point being is if someone came in and wanted to subdivide and wanted to build all their houses in critical area or in the corresponding setbacks, I wouldn't approve that, A. But B, if they wanted to go through that, they would have to go to our board of zoning appeals. So ultimately, all I'm getting at is we would still have control. You're not going to be able to proceed with getting building permits without an approval from us. You know, you talk about uh, uh, docks and permits and things like that. You look at all the developed properties, and a lot of them in Jenkins Point now have docks out to whether it's Horseshoe Creek or wherever if they were to build the houses now or subdivide it now ocr and the point is things have changed they're they're not approving as many and you're exactly right so if somebody comes in and says wait a minute you know going back to the other uh discussion before Boy, there you have smaller lots. Why can't I have smaller lots? They have a dock. Why can't I have a dock? Because the rules have changed and the dynamics of the zoning have changed over the period of time. We are now, you know, OCRM recognizes that, you know, maybe all these docks out here are not, you know, appropriate or not whatever. And so they're, you know, prohibiting that goes back to my original point. If we just keep it at what it is until we hear something different, uh, a proposal or a request to change or whatever, then we'll deal with it at that point. But I'm saying why, why do it now and say, okay, it's gonna be the same as everybody else when it may not have to be that, and we can have less houses out there, less strain on our utilities, less strain on the environment, and a really, if I, a lot of places, Jenkins Point is a very environmentally sensitive area because it's, it's out there in the middle of uh, the marsh, all sides around it. I don't know, again, uh, yeah. I'm only one person. If everybody else says, hey, you're, you're crazy, you're whistling in the wind, hey, okay. Won't be the first time. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to clarify there though. We, sure. we do have a little, you know, we would still have a dog in sure. with regard to the approval process for yeah, any my, development that goes on. My, my comment regarding the, the ability to develop kind of the second of the three pieces over here um, was they would have to make a connection in order to have it be accessible. So what our ordinance requires, if you cut a road in, um, basically any new structure has to be set back 25 feet from the OCR and critical line. Um, and then we also have setback requirements off of the property lines. Um, at its widest point, there's two connections to that property from the one that, that touches Jenkins Point Road. One over here and one over here. At its widest point, it's 30 and a half feet. So if you have to meet a 25 foot setback off of both property lines, you cannot cut a road in that location and meet our zoning requirements. Now you can apply for a variance to do but at that point, you're going before the Board of Zoning Appeals. It's a public hearing. Anyone who wants to oppose it has an opportunity to oppose sure. it. It's an open public process. So in this particular instance, I, I, I brought up OCRM because if you're doing anything around the mark, you're going to have to get OCRM approval. But in this particular case, whether OCRM approves it or not, if it doesn't meet the setback requirements of the town, we're not going to grant any approval absent of an approval from the Board of Zoning Appeals. Right. But here's one thing about, again, OCRM lines, 
And I remember because I was on ARC for five years when people would come with their plans and we would say, oh, get a, you know, uh, there were large houses being developed, let's say that on Marsh Point and so on. OCRM lines changed during the planning time. So at one time they were not able to put certain things in and then they moved it closer and depending upon the, the way they uh, measured it this time and not measured it and, you know, whatever. I never really understood uh, the dynamics of what made the OCRM change as, as many as it did. So when you're saying that that's what it is today, that's fine. In a couple of years, it may be something that allows them to put uh, a two-lane highway through there. I don't know. But uh, yeah. I'm being a little uh, <laughs> exaggerating here, but my point is OCRM lines do change and they have recently changed. Ask about people who were, you know, uh, for flood insurance and how some of those lines have changed and now their insurance is going down because they're in the same spot. But that's, that's FEMA. Those are two yeah, I know, I know. But the, the point is, they're government lines and they change like the wind. So. So I don't want Dan to feel like he's like out on the end of the branch <laughs> and none of us are weighing in. Um, originally, after we had the open house last fall and then we had our workshop, Dan and I have talked and initially my thought was, I mean, in complete, I'm in agreement with what he's saying about conservation and one per five acres, but um, doing a lot of research lately on property rights and the points that Paul was making and hearing some additional explanations from Joe. I have to say, I'm, I'm really kind of conflicted here of where to go, but I think I've been pushed over to the side of what's in this draft, but I'm kind of still wishy-washy on it. I don't know. The rest of council, but I didn't want Dan to feel like he's out there on the limb all by himself that we haven't <laughs> talked about it. Um, Here, I'll give you this, I'll be out on the limb with yeah. this sort of cut back behind me. And, and I, I do want to say the purpose of today's meeting is not to change this document, right? We'll do that at first reading, right? So that we're getting anyone can make a motion to recommend changes and we can vote it up or down. But um, I, I do want to say, well, we have our opinions. This at this point, this is your document. So you decide what you want it to say. If you want it to be one per 10 acres, that's a policy decision for, for council to make. So we'll give you our opinions, our recommendations, those type things, but ultimately you decide what goes in this document and what doesn't. So if you want to change it, if you want to add districts, modify districts, it's your ordinance to do with as you wish. Yeah, I just, like I said, I didn't want Dan to feel like he was out there by himself because we had had a, a lengthy discussion about and if today was first reading, I'm not sure how it would vote. I really need to think about it some more with these arguments in mind. Others? Well, don't all jump up at once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm satisfied with RSF1. So I, I, I listened to the discussion and I am, as I said, satisfied with the zoning as proposed as RSF. Do we need to speak? Oh, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, after three years and umpteen people and um, you know, we have a very distinguished person here that has gone through all of this, I am really not qualified to make a decision like that. I, I will go with what the other um, groups have decided. And I have got, been through all of this with Joe previously. I had a side discussion with him. I've seen the whole thing and I understood we were really talking about not 60 some odd acres, but 10 acres. And so, um, yeah, I, I kind of am staying with the um, recommendations um, that have been made as far as keep as making it uh, 
a single family um, where we were calling it RSF1. Perfect world green space will buy it. Well, that would be our conservation <laughs> easement. Yes. That's what I was going to say. The answer is it. Yeah, well, I, it. I know. You know that's 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 they're trying to do a lot, and that's another thing. You know, that's another part of the story. Is you know, at one time I probably would, and I'm very much the experts did this, and you work very hard on this, and I understand that, and I would most often defer to this. Over the past year, I've been working more with green space or you know, talking with them, and I've done some things with Kiowa Conservancy, and we've been talking about just the loss of green space all around here, whether it's parcels or next to us or on Seabrook. You know, a lot on, on, on Seabrook becomes, you, know, you got house, 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 and then you got an open lot or whatever. It's, it, you know, it's, I don't know. I'm just taking it more uh, seriously and trying to preserve as much uh, land as we possibly can and limit the amount of building that's going on within our purview. And if this is not within our purview, then it's fine. I, you know, I understand, and we move on. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to get my two cents in. And we're since almost lunchtime, man. And this this is probably more of a Heather question, but I don't even know like what the process because I, I don't believe like these particular properties are currently part of POA, and I obviously wasn't here when Jenkins Point was done, so I don't even know. What their process, what their obligations are, if it, you know, if anything did happen out here, regardless of density, kind of how they bring in, how they get access, do they become part of the POA? That stuff, I, I don't have answers to. That's a POA issue, but those are other things that are sitting out there that you know, before that developed would have to be uh, answered as well. Shall we continue on? <clears throat> All right, so now we're getting into the residential. We've already covered RS as one. Um, aside from the, the properties we just have been looking at, there was I think only one other property that we had that was gonna go over to RS as one. And this one actually is a little oddball piece of property. It actually has its own, I think it was tied up in litigation and there was a separate mm -hmm. zoning ordinance that was approved for this property um, only. Um, so basically it's completely surrounded by marsh. Um, there's a house under construction on it right now as we speak. So um, our recommendation was just that it go to RSF1. It's kind of a small uh, one-off Type well, geez, it's small, it's three and a half acres total, a lot of it being marsh. But uh, our recommendation, just based on the size, was that it go to um, RSF1. But um, other than that, I don't believe we have. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. If it's RSF1 and you just, uh, most of the, I would say at least an acre of that is marsh, does that mean that? You can build three houses on that little island because you can count that area that's marsh, or can you only count buildable area when you're discussing? I think we defined it as high ground, didn't we? Did you define Does it? Does that have a one acre ground? high ground? Okay, okay, so you couldn't count that. Okay, thank you. We'll double check, but I think we have it based on that. So RSF2 now is the um, second one that we have. Let me go back back in here. Um, RSF2 is basically the replacement. So if you look at our current zoning map and you see that white paint color, uh, it's labeled as SR, single family residential. 
again, it's not actually zoned single family residential, it's zoned planned development, but it is a single fa family residential subdistrict. Um, so what our ordinance currently says is any new lot that single family has to be uh, a minimum of one acre. Um, so in our, our new ordinance, we say, well, basically if it's something that's not developed yet, if it's gonna be an acre or more, it's gonna to go to RSF1, that's the properties we've been talking about. But basically everything else, all of the existing single family, um, under our current ordinance, um, they are considered conforming if they're 17,500 square feet or more. So the minimum under the RSF2 district is 17,500 square feet. So basically all existing single family um, areas, uh, except those that we've already mentioned, uh, are going to transition from uh, the SR to the RSF2. So that's really the, the lion's share of the town. Um, you know, all of our single family residential areas. So, you know, all those little streets down along the ocean, um, good chunks of oyster catcher, not this area, but um, Ocean Point, I think that's mm -hmm. called. Um, all the single family areas, um, you know, interior to the island with the exception of, you know, some of the multifamily areas, um, privateer going up to, um, you know, phases one through four of Jenkins Point. Um, pretty much all this will go RSF2. So it'll have a minimum 17,500 square feet. Um, anything that has less than 17,500 square feet, right now it's non-conforming. It'll still be non-conforming once we get into the new DSO. Um, but uh, um, as long as it meets all, if it's a vacant lot and it's under 17,500 square feet, you still build on it. You just have to meet all the setback requirements. You just can't create a new lot that's less than 17,500 square feet. So, um, the only RSF2 areas we have are all exclusively behind the gate. Uh, we don't have anything outside the gate that's RSF2. Um, any questions about that district? That one's really just pretty much a straight transition. Um, so, the next ones we get into are the multifamily. Um, so in our current DSO, it's all over the place. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have everything from single family homes to condos to townhomes to uh, what I call cluster development. So in the new DSO, we've recommended uh, replacing multifamily, kind of that one size fits all with four separate districts. So it will go from, from lowest density, least intense to highest. Um, the first one is RSF3. Um, that's basically taking the areas that are single family detached homes sitting on single family lots, but for whatever reason are zoned multifamily. So the areas we're talking about there are Hallover Point Circle, Hidden Oaks, Marsh Creek, Marsh Point, North Beach Village, St. Christopher Oaks, and the village at Seabrook. So basically these will become single family districts, but they'll become the RSF3 small lot. So they'll have a minimum lot um, square footage of 6,000 square feet. Um, and then they'll have their own setback and other requirements um, that are tied to that specific district. Um, so you'll see on the map, the RSF3 areas. Um, I think the village is the biggest one. It's kind of this orangish looking color here. Um, you know, anybody who's driving by looking at the village would say that's a nice single family neighborhood, mm -hmm. but it's zoned multifamily. So in the new DSO, it's gonna become small lot, single family. Because when you look at the PUD for the village, it has a minimum lot square footage of 6,000 square feet. We didn't just pick that up in there. Um, so we'll have the village. Um, there is um, Ocean Point down over here uh, off of Rolling Dune and Oyster Catcher. 
those are again single family homes on detached lots. Um, we have up here along uh, adjacent to the camp, we have Hidden Oaks and St. Christopher Oaks, I believe those two are called. Again, single family home, detached homes on individual lots. We have Hallover Point over here. Um, not the condo one up over here, but the single family homes behind it. Um, and then Marsh. It's Marsh. Marsh Point. Yeah, Marsh. Marsh Point. Marsh Point. Yeah. I can never keep my marshes. Um, this one over here, those are all detached homes on individual lots. So those would go to RSF3. Um, and then there's, I actually didn't know that this one existed as an R. Uh, SF3 type one, but there's a few houses up here on landfall um, going in towards Bay Point um, that are also small lot, um, single family as well. So those ones will all go just from multifamily to the new RSF3 district. Uh, any questions about RSF3? Hearing none. Um, the next one we have. Um, we created a new one called the cluster development. Um, the clusters are basically, they're part of the little you know, master plan development. Um, you may own just the structure or the property under the drip line of the structure, but um, this would include Dune Crest, Dune Law, Sea Law, Summerwind, Tarpon Pond, and Tree Law. So they're all you know, detached single family type structures, but they're not necessarily sitting on a you know single family lot. They're just kind of clustered around a, a larger um, development. So you'll see those kind of a <coughs> brownish color um, on our map. So um, down over here off of um, Captain Sam's, we have Doom Law, um, we have Sea Law. Again, you see just kind of like these little pods, um, little squares um, clustered around a uh, development here. Um, we have Tarpon Pond, Summer Wind, um, Tree Loft, Dune Loft. Um, so all those will become the new RCL district. And again, with those, they'll all have their own setback requirements and their own dimensional requirements and whatnot. Um, that we've tried to tailor to those particular types of developments. Next one we had is RTH, which is the, the new townhome district. Uh, for those who've basically taken all the townhome communities. So what makes it a townhome? It's basically um, usually gonna sit on a subdivided lot. So the individual owns the, the lot that the home sits on, but these are connected you know, share a common wall connected floor to ceiling. So they're not stacked like a condo. Um, they're just, you know, one next to the other, next to the other. You might have one building with three or four, or however many units, and they're all attached by a common wall, um, separated floor to ceiling. So with that, we have Beach Club Villas, Charlestown Place, Creek Watch, Deer Point, Dolphin Point, Fairway One, Fiddler's Cove, Offshore. Horseshoe Cove, Salt Marsh, uh, Shadow Wood, Shelter Cove, Spinnaker, and Wedgwood. And just to highlight a couple of those um, here on the map, um, you see uh, uh, Beach Club down over here, Dolphin Point, um, Spinnaker, I think is our biggest. Um, again, these are all sitting on individual lots. Um, you know, it might be one structure with three units separated. Um, from, from floor to ceiling. So those will be the townhome. Um, and then we have the last one of the multifamily is what I would call the true multifamily. That's where you have uh, multiple units in a building and generally they're stacked. Um, so in the, um, I think all the ones out here will have some sort of horizontal property regime. So they basically own, um, you know, what's inside their four walls, and then there's common ownership uh, of the exterior of the building with the common areas and the surrounding property. 
Um, so for those, you have Atrium, Bay Point, Bohicket, Center Court, Chateau by the Green, Courtside, Heron Point, High Hammock, Live Oak, Marsh Walk, Ocean Wind, Pelican Watch, um, and uh, Racket Club Villas. And you can see those kind of in that dark, they don't match 100%, but they look a little more brown on here. Uh, the Pelican Watch, High Hammock. Um, and you see, unlike the townhomes and the clusters where someone may own like the drip line of the structure, there's an actual little lot that they may own. Um, you know, these ones, they're not owning individually any real property. So you don't see uh, any squares or anything on here. Uh, but this is Pelican Watch over here on the left side. We have High Hammock Villas. Um, put that a couple up over here off of uh, um, Long Bend. Um, we have uh, Marsh Walk and Courtside and um, several others. So um, that's what we basically will transition to the true multifamily um, zoning district. <clears throat> In the support districts. Um, Joe, can I back up just one sure. real quick? Um, you know, this piece of property that sits right over here. Oh, yes. That you. 15 acres. Can, can we talk about that a little bit? Is that what it's zoned in our current DSO? Yeah, so the recommendation on the new map is that we um, zone, I meant to say that, I appreciate you bringing that. Um, the recommended zoning is RTH, which is the townhome district. Um, right now it is zoned multifamily. I didn't know this until I was trying to research it. Um, it's actually considered part of the Bohicket Marina community. Um, believe it or not, I did not know that until I found it in the ordinance. That hasn't come um, up at all as we talked about that. Property. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So with this new DSO, the Bohicket Marina PUD goes away. Uh -huh. um, but right now it is zoned um, for multifamily um, by right. Um, and our, our current DSO, there was a change made several years ago where basically it said any new multifamily um, would have to be townhome style. So you can no longer stack units. You couldn't have more than I think three per building um, separated from floor to ceiling. So this is basically just a continuation of what's approved or what's allowed out there today. Um, it does not have to be townhome. Um, that's something that's your discretion, what you feel it should be zoned. The recommendation that we put on the map is to carry forward what's allowed there today, but it doesn't have to be. If you want to zone it something else, if you want it to be single family, if you want it to be commercial, um, you know, that's within your uh, discretion as council to designate the zoning um, for this property. Um, but what, what's there is a continuation of, of what's allowed currently. Um, same thing for there's one. Uh, over adjacent to Marsh Walk, um, surrounding the, the tennis courts over here. Um, Marsh Walk's on both sides. This is, as far as I know, the only, along with the one we just talked about, these are the only two undeveloped multifamily parcels in town. Um, this one, if you recall, had a variance request last year that was denied. Um, it has been purchased. We do expect somebody to come forward with a, a new plan. Um, for that, but again, right now it's it's zone to allow townhomes. Our recommendation is to allow townhomes. If you want to change that, you can. Um, but you know, typically you'd want something consistent either with what's allowed today or what's allowed on surrounding property. And this particular one, surrounding property is recreation and. Um, true multifamily. Mm -hmm. So if there's a concern about density and those type things, the one that makes the most sense is probably true multifamily. If you're not wanting to add new density, the next step down would be townhomes, which is what's currently allowed there today. And that's what we've recommended in the map. Chair, can go back to the other one that uh, Jerry brought up. You said it 
You said that that was changed how long ago? The current ordinance? You said it was changed from the townhomes. Well, the, the current DSO, it was a text amendment. There wasn't a rezoning. Nothing changed regarding the zoning of the property. The actual text of the DSO is what was amended um, because at the time it, it allowed different types of multifamily. And when that change was made, I, I don't have the exact date right off hand, but I, I can find it. My point is something was changed though. Yeah, it was changed in the text. That if was the density more, changed? Uh, Would that have affected a change in density? May have. I can look it up if you guys are talking. I'll let you know. No, no, no. My point is this. If the density changed, that meant that whoever could build on that went from so many units to so many units. And it sounds like it went less. Because I think you said it was stackable at one time, you know, and it's and now a townhome type of thing. So therefore it's less. Hey, why don't we uh, really go out on the limb and say, you know, whatever, you know, make it single family. And then if they come back and say, well, we it was this, you know, I mean, again, I'm, that is a beautiful piece of property overlooking the sunset every time. Boy, I mean, that is just unreal. And I, you know, you know at one time coming into this, uh, into Seabrook, that going down Seabrook Island Road, the left-hand side is going to be developed to some degree we could somehow limit. And that one on the left side, we have no control over. This one we do. I mean, uh, what it, I mean, I know it's going out on a limb. But, uh, yeah, who wants to be on council when they uh, start clearing that to go? Exactly. <laughs> People are going to be going. Again, this is, this is our chance to to really to do something um, to conserve land. The only way you can conserve it is to buy it. <laughs> I know that. And I know my, my point you is though. You can't zoning to, to make a conservation district. You just can't do that. No, no, I understand. And I'm not saying. You're just saying reduce the impact. Reduce the impact, make it. And then if they come back, you know, you put the. I mean, there's a big difference between. Yeah, they just think it's like they're here on the strip of the marsh. Yeah. To, to, there's a big difference between multifamily and single homes. You know, maybe you could put in a nice uh, buffer along the uh, bike path that we have there uh, that we wouldn't see it you're more likely to be able to do that if it's less. Maybe we'll let them do half of it uh, multifamily and then, you know, uh, donate the other half to uh, Conservation and Park. I'm still, I'm pushing. I'm to make I you know, I think townhomes is, a, is a, looking at the piece of property. I mean, I, I just can't see making this single family. I mean, I, just, I, I know, but I just, I mean, I can't take people's property. You can't, this is a private, somebody owns this piece of property and you are now limiting the use of that property. Um, well, that's why I asked the first question. Somewhere along the line, we did change it. Council changed it. And that's why I said, what was the effect of that? In other words, did we go from uh, eight units per acre to six or four units per acre? It's, it's no, currently it's seven. seven. It's generally what? It's currently seven. And what was it before? Well, we'd have to go back to the- Yeah, I know. To find but my point is, you understand what I'm saying? But I, I think the PUD may have been seven too, so I don't think yeah. it had any net change. 
Okay. I think it just went from being able to be stackable to being townhomes. Yeah. You can have more than three yeah. Yeah. It's That's just what I mean. yeah. It's just a difference between well, stacking them. And here's and just a thought to throw out for you guys. The, the, those 15 acres are owned by the same person who owns across that the street. owns these 300 acres. Yeah. And and I personally don't think we should like be upsetting oh, him about it because he has been very generous with some donations. So it'd be great when he develops. He says, well, you know, let's use that over here for some type of green space or part yeah. of her yeah. public area oh, sure. and houses over here. So yeah, I'm not no, inclined to change I, it at this point and get him well, all upset. Yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's it's that's a, really good. Thing. But as, uh, you know, I hate to be the person on council when they bring the bulldozers in there. And in fact, I'm going to give them Pat's phone number. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, the short term <laughs> rental people are. Anyway, so. it's just, but I mean, when you look at the density here in see when you pull it up and, and you look at the, geez, you know. Um, it's just I, definitely a piece of property that as people drive onto the island, don't realize well, it's developable. They just think there's like a buffer there and then it's yes. large. Well, and they, they don't know there's 15 acres sitting there. So yeah. it'll be a surprise if somebody comes well, to develop it to a whole lot of super hurt. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> no, I, I really do appreciate it. I meant to bring that up. Totally wow. Um, okay, jumping ahead to the support districts. Um, right now, we have the commercial retail office that's going to transition to um, basically just a rebrand to LC Limited Commercial. Um, the only change i'd already mentioned the areas near the, the tip of the island by the golf course are currently zoned commercial those will no longer be commercial but pretty much everything else um, is is outside of the gate um, here, so it's this light pink color um, we have uh, basically the areas around landfall way so uh, the real estate office where McCann's was, uh, little uh, NUSC office, the executive building that the club now owns, the POA office, um, those will all be commercial, uh, limited commercial, which includes um, retail, restaurant, office, um, medical uses, things of that nature. And then we also pulled in uh, up here near the entrance to the marina, the uh, Mm -hmm. old real estate office um, here and the, I guess what we're calling the future MUSC site um, on the other side. Uh, those would all go to um, limited commercial. And so Joe, would you go back to that map for a second? Mm -hmm. um, where the peak ends there, and then we go off to the end of where the circle is. The property, yeah, the property on that side, the pink side of the road, um, is that, who is that owned by? Is that, well, is that in the town? It's, it's not owned by Atlantic Partners, who owns Freshfield, okay. but it's in the town of Kiowa. And it's in the town of Kiowa, okay. So we only own... We don't own it, it's... Yeah, we have the... Yeah. Oh, oh, so this, this red line is our municipal limits. So okay. Municipal limits That's fine. Right That's here. And then we have the road. Yeah, the road comes out okay. to here. That was done in the 90s. So yeah. our sign is really not on our... Yeah, it is not. Uh, in the old ways. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Okay. Uh, but yeah, this is in Kiowa. The Seafield site is in it's Kiowa. There, yeah. And then basically everything on this side <laughs> between Seafield and Town Hall is uh, unincorporated town. Okay. Uh, any other questions about the limited commercial district? Hearing none, we had in our ordinance, actually, I don't even remember if it was in the ordinance. It was on the map, it was called government property. Um, we have a new district called community um, facilities. Um, for that, we've included town hall the uh, utility commission um, facilities, the wastewater treatment plant, 
and the water towers and St. John's fire station. So these are basically publicly owned um, community and, and government type facilities. We have town hall here. Um, this is the uh, utility commission, um, utility operation um, down back over here. And then going down Captain Sam's, we have the fire station and the, the water tower property. So pretty, pretty self-explanatory of those ones. Um, as Paul mentioned, we have currently a light industrial district. We don't have any industrial out here. I presume nobody wants any heavy industry anywhere on the island. So uh, our recommendation was to uh, just eliminate the LI district. Um, no Amazon distribution center? No. Okay. <laughs> Throw it out there just in case. <laughs> uh, the we question. can't get, we barely get them to come out here and deliver. That's <laughs> <laughs> because they don't have a distribution center. <laughs> I neglected to I mean, I talk about the utility, but there's also the um, POA and club have some um, like storage yeah. and, and shop areas. So we did lump those in with um, community facilities okay. as well. So no industry. Um, we have a new district, which we've called the Marina Mixed Use District. Um, it is uh, intended, like it says, to be uh, mixed use in nature, can have a mixture of uses. You can see it um, on the map over here. Um, it's the purple color. Um, right now, it's primarily accounting for the marina, the, the dry dock, um, the commercial uses. Um, there are a couple upstairs residential units mm -hmm. above uh, on this side. Um, but also, if and when this neighboring property ever develops, um, I know just as staff, our recommendation would be that it just be a continuation of um, the existing marina here. Um, so right now, the only marina mixed use will be the actual marina itself. Um, but if and hopefully when this property does come in, then we would extend that district out to uh, accommodate that property as well. That's if it becomes part of, because right now it's not part of yeah, city. county right, right now. Right, so we'd have to annex that, correct? Yeah, and if, if they want um, sewer, they're gonna have to annex. Okay. That's their only option for sewer. It's owned by the owner of the marine. Right, yeah. Yeah, they, they have closed on. Uh, and then the only other one we have is an overlay district. Um, I don't know if that shows up on GIS or not. Um, it does on the PDF map. He's got a he's got a funny for it. Oh, is there a second? Yeah, it's right above the zoning. Oh, I see. Oh. So we have an overlay district. Um, and basically the reason for that is it, it kind of ties to all the discussion and the debate that came out around the encroachment permit for sea fields. Um, and then just, you know, the fact that this is such a high profile corridor um, that will have different zoning designations kind of as you go along, you know, from the area around the gate all the way up to the traffic circle. The thought was to place an overlay district um, on top of that. And basically the purpose of the overlay is it, it imposes an additional set of requirements above and beyond um, what may be required in the underlying zoning district. So the underlying zoning district will range everything from you know, town hall is community facilities and the property across the street is town home. And you get up, you have uh, commercial around the marina. The overlay is intended just to give us a, a common set of requirements that can apply uniformly across each of those different districts. So it'll, it, and with this being really the, the public um, portion of Seabrook Island Road, it'll give us control over things like you know, access points and spacing between driveways, um, design, signage, 
Um, <clears throat> if you recall, when we did the uh, amended the ordinance to allow the POA to put up the, the digital yeah. message board, we actually had to extend the Seabrook Island corridor to inside the gate because um, when we allowed it in that area, we only really wanted to allow it in a very narrow location. So having an overlay gives us a little bit more flexibility where we can have special requirements that would apply only along that corridor. So um, that was one. We, we have a few things in there in the, in the current draft. There may be uh, opportunities to you know further tweak and add stuff. Uh, in the future, as as you know, other development may happen uh, in the future, whether in town or uh, in the county along that corridor. But um, we, the committee and, and, and planning commission, in recommending it, um, all felt that that was something um, beneficial to have in place. So um, we will see that reflected on the map as well. Uh, there's like a, a orange um, hash line and a I think it is it 250 feet in both directions. So our overlay yeah. district actually is in areas that are not in the town. <clears throat> um, it yes. would it's basically running, I don't remember if it's off of center line or the edge of right of way. Um, anything that happens that's outside of our jurisdiction is not going to be subject to the overlay. But assuming you know the developer of this property next door mm -hmm. is probably going to want access in the future. That access will become subject to. The so the minute they want access, then they have to. Yeah, it's it's not going to apply to you know their development that's outside of our town limits. Okay. But to the extent that their development will tie into what is in our town limits, at that point the overlay would. Okay. Would have um, some control gives you the ability to trade access for better signage, landscaping, whatever you want along that corridor. Yeah, we, we did one of these when I was in um, Fort Mill. We actually had a brand new um, road coming. Um, it was a bypass that ran along the southern and eastern part of town. and. Um, we did an overlay district because, I mean, it basically went through woods. There was nothing there. We knew there was going to be development pressure, and we were trying to get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. And I think if you looked at this corridor, knowing, yeah. hey, the marina's redeveloping, right. you have MUSC coming, you have this piece of property um, you know, where the real estate office was, you have this townhome site, you have hundreds of acres. It just makes sense to get ahead of it by putting some things in place that, that we can use to you know, have an additional level of control uh, over things that happen along that corridor. Um, we, we did it in Fort Mill, I, I think to, to great success. We required things along that corridor like wider sidewalks and pedestrian lighting and you know, just a whole bunch of higher level improvements for new development you know, that if you were along major intersections, the development you know, the intent was to bring it up closer to the street to create more pedestrian friendly walkable areas and um, you know I, I just went back back in New Year's Eve and I mean as expected there's all kinds of new stuff going up along that corridor and it's really nice to be able to see you know that we had the foresight five six seven years ago to put this in place and as all that development is happening you know, they're basically at no cost to the town piecing together like a 10 foot pathway that's running along parallel to the right of way. And, you know, just the quality of the development, the type of development um, just looks great. So overlays, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan and a big proponent of them. And I think in our case um, would add a, a lot of value to the town. So. With that, I think that gets us to the end of our um, zoning district discussion. Um, any other general questions, comments, topics related to zoning districts, what's allowed in zoning districts, or anything like that that we have not covered as of yet? I don't have a question, Joe, but could 
Um, we print out a couple copies of this transition document you've been working from. Mm -hmm. I somehow misplaced it or I don't have it. And I would oh, really like one. to, yeah, this that was up on the screen. Could we print yeah. out a couple? We, we can do them as 11 by 17. I think they're scaled to 11 by 17, so you can have large copies. That would be, <laughs> that would be this size. That would be great mm -hmm. if we could get those printed today. Get a rope on one side and on the other side. Um, okay, any other questions about the districts or anything? We want to take a five minute break and we come back and do non conformities or I, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Everybody's still awake? <laughs> I mean, 15 minutes, Joe. Yeah. You want to do 15 minutes? I need mean, 15 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anybody need any lunch or anything? Do we need to order lunch?
Um, we are live. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're there. <laughs> All right. So now that we finished um, discussion of the districts, I'd like to go through and just kind of have a discussion about a few other topics, and then um, we'll uh, open it up for other items for uh, discussion. The, the first one I wanted to touch on was um, Article Twenty One. Um, which deals with um, non-conformities in the draft okay. ESO. <clears throat> so I'm starting on page 21-1. Um, as we said earlier, the, the primary objective of the new DSO was not to create new non-conformities, but to, as best we could, try to address as many as we can of the existing nonconformities, knowing that we're never going to hit all of them. And inevitably, there probably will be a few uses and, and structures that may um, become nonconforming. But, but I will say we've gone to great lengths to try to avoid that to the extent that we can. I mean, to the point of like, you know, reviewing development plans and subdivision plats, looking to see you know what's out there, what's where. Um, so we we tried to hit as many as we can, but I, I promise you, we didn't get all of them. I'm sure there will be um, some nonconformities um, created, but hopefully those will be uh, few and far between. Um, the two primary things we'll look at for nonconformities are nonconforming uses and nonconforming. Structures. So basically, a non conforming use. Um, when you look at each of the zoning districts, it has the list of what uses are either allowed, permitted by right, the P, or conditional with the C. Um, and basically, when a property is within a zoning district, only the uses that are allowed within that district are allowed. So if you have something that was legally in existence before, the ordinance was adopted. Um, it's considered a non-conforming use once the ordinance changes. So if you have a piece of property that today, not that we have any, but just say we did, we had one that was zoned um, residential and we switched it to commercial. Well, if there's a house on that property, that house would become a non-conforming use because commercial probably is not going to allow a residential dwelling. So the way our ordinance is structured is if you have a nonconformity like that, the person who's there can continue as long as it was legally in existence before the ordinance change. So in that example, if you had a residence, you change the zoning district, residences are no longer allowed in the new district, well, that person can stay there. Um, they don't have to go with them, they don't have to pack up and move away. Um, they'd be considered a, a nonconforming use. So um, what this ordinance says is that they can, once they're non-conforming, I mean, grandfathered is, is the term you hear most often, mm -hmm. that they're grandfathered. So they're there, they can stay there. Um, what they cannot do is they can change it to a conforming use and then go back to what it was. So if it went from residential to commercial, they couldn't change it from a home to an office and then a couple of years later, go back to a home. Once you've abandoned the non-conforming use, you can't go back and reestablish it. Um, you can't can change from, you cannot change from one non-conforming use to another non-conforming use. So maybe you could have a, in a residential district, you uh, could have a daycare, but because that home is now non-conforming, if you change it, you can only change it to something that is conforming. You couldn't go and say, well, residential allows a daycare, so I could put a daycare in it. No, you can only put a permitted commercial use at that point. 
um, and it can't be reestablished after the fact. Um, it cannot be enlarged or extended except to be brought into conformity. So you can't make it more non-conforming than it is. Um, you can't move it. Um, and if it's been abandoned for a period of 12 consecutive months or 18 months in a two year period, it's deemed abandoned. And once it's been abandoned, you can't reestablish it. So the example I used, if it was a house, somebody's moved out, utilities are shut off, nobody's lived there for 12 consecutive months, you can say that use is abandoned and now somebody could not go in and reestablish it as a house at that point. They would only be able to establish a legal commercial use in that example. Um, and we give examples of things that we would take into consideration of what constitutes abandonment. So utilities are disconnected, if it's fallen into disrepair, um, if the signs um, have been removed, if equipment or fixtures necessary have been removed, or kind of catch all other actions which to the zoning administrator constitute an intention to abandon the non-conforming use. So that one I, I hope is pretty straightforward. Um, what we're most likely to have are non-conforming buildings, non-conforming structures. So these by and large are going to be um, legally non-conforming. So at the time they were built, we presume they were legally permitted, not always a given, but for the sake of this exercise, we'll presume they were legally permitted. Um, and what we see out here, I said before, so much of what's out here predates the town's incorporation. So we have non-conformity all over the place. You know, properties that are built too close to a property line or the marsh has shifted over time and now they're too close to a marsh. Um, what we had and what we have in our current ordinance basically is, um, you know, if it's non-conforming, if it's made non-conforming, it can stay there just like a non-conforming use, it's, it's grandfathered, um, but you cannot expand the non-conforming. So if it's, you know, part of the house is five feet off the property line, it has to be 15. Well, you can't expand that house and you know go three feet off the line. You can't expand the non-conformity. So if it's you know only two feet are encroaching, you can't say, well, it's encroaching two feet here. So now the entire wall can move out two feet. Um, that's not allowed under our current ordinance. But the biggest issue we have is with the 50% rule. And that basically says if you have a non-conformity and you, um, you know, do more than 50% of the value of the structure and renovations, repairs, whatever. Um, and it's over a, I think it's five year period. Um, then yeah, it's not just one shot, it's cumulative okay. over a period. So if we have one that comes in that's close, we actually look at several years worth of permit data. And if it puts it over, they either have to give us an appraisal showing the actual fair market value of the property um, is more than double the value of all those repairs, or they have to bring it, the entire structure into conformity, um, or they just don't do the upgrades and renovations. Um, what this ordinance does is it basically takes that 50% rule off the books. Okay. So essentially, we talked about this at length with the committee. If you have part of your house that was built and it's you know, over the setback line, and it's been there, and everyone knows it's been there, it's not bothering anybody, and it's been there for 40 years. If you renovate your house, you don't have to remove that encroachment. Um, and this is one where I said I didn't personally like the result of what's in here, but I'll, I'll tell you what's in here, and then I'll tell you my thoughts on it. Um, the draft ordinance says not only can you keep what's there, but you can actually expand the non conformity So as long as it meets certain conditions, you can expand it. Um, so it may not be enlarged or altered in a way to increase its non-conformity, 
except in cases where the setback of the building or structure is non-conforming by 50% or less of the distance required by this ordinance. So let's use a side yard setback because that's what's pulled up here on the screen. So if you had a house and you know this part, this kind of shaded section, it's on page 21-2, we can kind of follow along. Um, but you have the existing non-conforming structure and you'll see, you know, this black dotted line, that's the side yard setback. Well, this existing structure is actually encroaching into the side yard setback. What our current ordinance says is if you exceed 50% of that structure, you have to remove that non-conforming. So you basically have to lop off part of the house to comply with that black shaded line side yard setback. Um, <clears throat> what the recommended ordinance says, not only can you leave what's there, you can actually expand what's there as long as it's not encroaching more than 50%. So on here, you see there's an addition on the front, there's an addition on the back. Um, it has to follow the, the plane of what's there. So if we use 50% or less, encroachment. So say we have a, a 15 foot side yard setback. If the encroachment is um, seven and a half feet or less into that setback, um, not only can they keep it there, but they can now extend the non-conformity. The non so in this example, you see they've added an addition and the addition goes up to the existing wall. So it's along the same plane and it's not more than 50% of the encroachment. Um, that's what's in this document. That's what's been uh, recommended by the um, committee. Um, <coughs> Can I ask a question? Sure. That? I understand the 50% from left to right is what we're talking about. Um, and the additions looks like a little porch or something, but would they be able to can put a whole giant wing out there with this? And as long as they kept along that red line, they could take that up to the second, the last arrow that's up there. They would be able to, where it says setback line that arrow. I mean, they'd really be able to put the whole, whole other wing out there. Is that what you're saying? Just as long as it's not over the 50% from the sideline. Yes, as long as it's not encroaching more than 50% into okay. the required setback. And it's along, and it's along that same, same plane. plane. They could go back to the back of the back line. Yeah. And that, that is not as common. Um, I, mean, I, I have seen it places, but typically what you have is what's there can stay there, mm -hmm. but any addition has to meet the current requirements. Yeah. So in this case, if you do an addition, you know, what's there is there, can stay there. You don't have to take it down. You know, what you have to do right now. Uh, you don't have to do that. Anymore. You can leave it there. You can still go in, renovate it. Um, you know, the 50% rule threshold no longer in play. Um, it's there, it can stay there. But if you add on to it, the addition has to meet the current requirements. So, you know, in this particular case, the addition might have to move over a couple feet. That's, in my opinion, the most common thing that you see. Um, that was my preference when this came up for discussion, um, but that's not what made it into the um, final document. Ultimately, this is a policy decision. However you want it to be worded is what we'll go with. But uh, my concern is the exact situation that Pat just referenced that, you know, yeah, one little part of the house that's encroaching a couple feet, yeah. it's been there forever, not a big deal. That's one thing. But if you can now do like an entire <laughs> expansion along the yeah, um, just... non-conformity, I don't know that I would want that, but I do have to report that's what the committee and planning commission both recommended. And what and is what, the what rationale? Yeah, what's their rationale? Is there is, is that any structure <laughs> too? Like like could that be a swimming pool or a big old open deck with a grill and mm -hmm. porch and I mean, it all of a sudden could be over. I'm saying, so hypothetically years. speaking, yeah. if you had some that had an existing non conforming structure that's significantly. Well, I think you can enlarge 
like the house can be enlarged on the house. I don't think you can take the house out and then replace it. Well, I mean, replace it, but I meant like, could you, is it saying that you just have to run parallel with that? Is it like, that's what I'm saying. Like, it was like, could you lock the pool in there as long as it's It has to be the same building or structure. Yeah. It's not. It has to be the same structure. Okay. Okay. So but if it, I think so the rationale it, was the, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, there's so many non-conformities in, in the town. And a couple of our members were on the Board of Appeals. And I think the intent was to allow more flexibility because of the, uh, some of the very small lots we have in the town, uh, the, the kinds of variance requests that the Board of Appeals is getting are typically setback requirements. And so, I, I think this was an attempt to allow more flexibility, recognizing that in, in a lot of cases, um, and they even brought up some, some recent cases where the person couldn't expand the way they wanted to because of wetland issues or what have you. Um, so I, I, I just think this was an attempt to provide more flexibility. But it's but basically it has to be the same type of structure. So if the porch is encroaching, they could expand the porch, but they can't. Well, the porch is attached to this, the, building. the building. It's part of the building. Okay. Um, if it was a detached accessory building, they couldn't use that as justification to expand the house. Okay. Okay, but if, um, so, Okay. And I do understand it because I know that there's just a ton of non-conforming lots that, <clears throat> and we want them renovated for sure. So it becomes that balancing act, I guess, between one and the other it is. I, I think Joe's earlier point about removing that 50% thing altogether was seen as a disincentive for people improving their property. Yeah. Because as soon as you went over that magic 50% yeah. mark, you had to do major reconstruction. Yeah, and I didn't realize it was a five-year time frame. Mm -hmm. I thought it was within one building. But suppose one building cycle. So suppose ooh. you're you're the next door neighbor on and looking at this. Yeah. And you're the one that's on the you know left side of that property, and they're going to add all the way back, and you're saying, "Wait a minute, I don't want that on my property." Do you have an avenue because it's it's not like you have to get a variance and like when you get a variance you go to all your neighbors and so on so you're as a neighbor out of luck see that, that that's, that's the part that bothers me that, that's why i don't like it um and you know if th there may be a, a justifiable reason for doing it but in my opinion that's something you should have to demonstrate and get a variance for. So, I mean, if there's marsh on the property that precludes you from, yes. you know, doing it in a conforming location, then maybe you go and, and ask for a variance and, you know, maybe it gets approved, maybe it doesn't, but it's a, a public process. The neighbors can come out and say, yeah, I have no problem with it. And I hate this. It's going to ruin my life and you should never mm -hmm. approve it. Um, but it's, it's a process. It's not just a given, you know, Right. Okay, here you go. You get it. Well, again, it, I, I think that the whole idea of having setbacks um, is so that your neighbors, you know, you're not right on the, the line. I mean, there's more to consider than your property. It's part of, you know, the neighborhood or whatever. Yeah, but I think one of, you know, I think somewhat related to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, <laughs> uh, I know that the village has a tremendous problem with this and the houses were built, you know, there was all sorts of things that went on. And so I think it would be an, an I'm kind of arguing against what I was saying before. I guess I think it would be a really odd thing that they were going to build an entire 
wing out to the back of the, typically what's going on is they're just adding a small piece. I was, I was confused with the 50%. Um, I thought it, in one way, I thought it was 50% of the area that was encroaching. You know what I mean? It was, in other words, if, if you have a, a 200 square foot part of the house that's encroaching, you can't add more than another 200 square feet that encroaches. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, you can't add, you know, I, that's why I was asking about it's not a blank check. Yeah, it's not a blank check, exactly. It's a, there's something in there that that would have <clears throat> at least the thing is you again I, I'm going back to my AOC experience. I know we really looked at these things. I, I as far as setbacks and, mm -hmm. and things like that, I mean we were really tuned in to making sure that plot plans conform to where they're supposed to be. And if you're, and I understand what you're saying, the, yeah. the villages are- They are like bad set of teeth. Going but, in there. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, that's been relatively new. I could see some of the older properties and, and things like that. Well. You know, I think people have been more concerned in the last 10 years than they were, you know, prior to that, having been here for so long. Um, I just, I don't, I think there's a more concerted effort for people now than there was previously. And certainly in the last five years, I know for sure people are a lot more concerned about this. But I think you'd be surprised at the amount of homes that have even a little part piece, you know, could be heating and air unit, you know, it could be um, a part of a porch or whatever. That, that well, is but that goes back to the whole point of the process, the variance process. If it is just a small, uh, and I know people who have cut, you know, your air conditioning stand because you're on a, you know, not a straight yeah, rectangular yeah. lot. People have had to cut off corners of their, yes, yeah. you know, of or that. Or, or now, to me, a variance for letting that go is not a big deal. But, like I said, if this, your example, bringing that whole thing out, and now that whole side is in the setback, is really encroaching not only on the that, but on your neighbor's privacy, because you're getting closer to, to, your building is getting closer to them, whatever you're building. And that way, if you have a variance process, you know, somebody's putting, how would you like to put a big deck there? And by the way, that's right outside where my bedroom is. And, uh, you know. The four criteria of a variance is that it won't be a detriment to the adjacent property. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean that yeah, I, I I agree with what you're saying. I mean that's that's the big there is. But yeah. but even if it is something that we would all say is fairly simple, like an AC stand. You know, yeah, it's an AC stand. I get more comparable when I was zoning administrator. I got more complaints about AC stands that being too close to the line because now somebody has to listen to the AC fan. Yeah. <laughs> it may seem oh, I, like I something agree. Very, very yeah, small I small and it's yeah. but I mean, I mean they can definitely have an adverse. So that's why I asked about like expand, like doing a if someone were to run the way you said, and I guess it would have to be part of the structure. So I don't entirely know we're getting complex here, but this is kind of the fun thing to do with these is come up with a doomsday scenario. And if someone wanted to build uh, with a with a deck addition that's 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 attached to the existing structure that goes all the way out, and they wanted to slap a big pool in there, and then say they wanted to make it a short term rental, and it's a big house that's X size. I'm just I'm just saying that you have you have this place that's got a big old pool that's slapped right next to the property line. Why were they able to put this pool so close to my property line? It's because of that section. Right? It was because that one little section yeah. that was sticking so out. Which, which what this is doing though is eliminating that 50% rural section, which is a good 
good stuff. Good to get yeah. But then there's this little caveat in there that could open up Pandora's box in a few states. Next. So how would you guys change this? Your recommendation to leave it out, or how would you change this? Uh, I would keep, I mean, what we have, not having the 50% rule is, is good. Mm -hmm. What's there can stay there. Um, my recommendation would be any any addition would have to meet the current setback requirements. That's kind of a de facto standard. Now, if you have a hardship or something, you always have the ability to apply yes. for a variance. Right. Exactly. And there's yes. a, a, an administrative procedure in place for that to be considered and you know, if the yeah. board agrees with your argument and meets the criteria and the board can grant a variance. Yeah. So, I mean, to, that's to, to me, for. this kind of undermines the purpose of the setback. Um, and and I, I personally don't like it, but it's what was recommended, so. And it, it doesn't protect the neighbors. That's, I'm kind of on that. You know, yeah. there's no protection for the neighbor if all of a sudden yeah. there's this Deck overlooking. I should they apply for a variance, even if they gave it, at least the neighbor gets an opportunity. Right, yeah, exactly. To make it make exactly. sense about it. And the, uh, you know, my husband's on the board of zoning, and I don't think they're overtaxed. I think they, they can meet a little bit more often. <laughs> we haven't met yet since I've been here. I know. So, <laughs> um, yeah, he hasn't been to a meeting in months. So, I, you know, I, it, and uh, now I'm That's fighting again. Now I'm on. Now I'm on this side of, of changing something that a whole group of people have thought was a great idea. And I'm and that bothers me because I really think that a lot of thought went into this. It just um, Yeah, I, I don't want to ignore the intent of what they were trying yeah. to do. I mean there are a lot of non-conformities, yeah. you know, by which is why I was being built you know, before we became a town. But um, I, I I think like I said, this to me is is you know, a detriment, a potential detriment to neighboring property owners. It, it undermines the um, intent of our setback requirements. Um, and, and I will say, I, I know the version you have is the official first reading version. Um, what I intend to do, I'm still going through looking for minor corrections, those type things. I, prior to first reading, I would like to submit a list of what I would call staff recommended Recommendation. amendments. Um, this is probably the top one on my list, but this is a policy matter. So I didn't want to just throw something out and say, I think you should change this without taking the time to discuss it. Well, what about what I was saying earlier? What's that if, you know, if 100 square feet were, were non-conforming, you could only add up to another 100 square feet. In other words, in other words, it's 50% of what is non-conforming. And that would maybe be a balance between these two things. I think the thing that is upsetting to all of us is that Katie bar the door, they can build a whole giant house out the side of their, you know, mm -hmm. if they go with this particular one. Um, but well, I think Joe brings up the point that the whole point of having setbacks is, 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 is to protect the neighbor yeah. and to make sure there's enough one. So what we're going to do is because a mistake was made 30 years ago and allow people to encroach on the setback for whatever reason the mistake was made. And it, we're it gonna, may not have even been a mistake. No, it right. may have been most likely allowed. It was allowed. It was an allowed. Who allowed it? Well, the setback's going to be different. Yeah. They would oh, just okay. See the change. 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 The we're going to allow that to compound itself, is what it is. I'd like to see the procedure where if it was a hardship, they could go apply for a variance, but then everybody gets to weigh in on it. You know, the neighbors it's just the, yeah. the normal. So, whatever yeah, that's, that is, the normal, that is, that is, the, that is that's the procedure. Do, there's a public I, notice requirement yeah, for the variance specifically. I know in, in in Hilton Head, it was all properties within a 350 foot yep. radius. I think you guys have done it just to impact in properties. Yes. Yeah. So that yeah. would be just leaving our leaving it as, it. as it, right? No. Well, well except for removing the 50%. We're, we're getting rid of the 50% part. Yeah. Yeah. But with number one, you just put a period after the word non conformity in the third line and delete everything okay. except on. 
Yeah, I don't like, I think Pandora's box is a good reference. It's non conforming, is that what yeah. you're saying? Okay, and then just, yeah. So you're yeah. okay if I submit that as a recommended amendment? I think so. I, so. I yeah. mean, this that is. Well, let's look at your list and then yeah. you could go down that. And if, but we understand what this is okay. now. I mean, most of the stuff I have is just minor. Well, that's fine. I mean, let's take a look at it and then we'll vote on it when that's um, appropriate. Anywhere to the 50%, I believe that's what you're saying. So there, there were a couple instances and in, with this now kind of moving into the adoption phase, I know Tyler's kind of been looking at when somebody calls mm -hmm. and they want to know what the requirement is, even though this one's not on the books yet, we're kind of already looking at, well, here's what the new ordinance says. And so we, we have come across a few things um, you know, that have come up, whether it's you know, MDLC site or a couple other sites like, wait a minute, is, is this what we actually mean when we say that? Um, so we, we do have a few of those. Um, one of them, it's on 11, page 11 is on. Said eleven. Why is in uh, section eleven so much? Again, I think you answered this question for me. So much highlighted because there was an entire section that was rewritten. Um, okay, this just highlighting that it was changed from the prior version. I got you. So eleven three a one. Uh, this one came up. <coughs> This is probably more of a call question. 11-3-A. Yeah. When, when two adjoining properties are in dissimilar districts where a non-residential use abuts a residential use in the same district, the property with the, within the district allowing the more intense use or the site containing the non-residential use abutting residential shall provide the buffer. And this one came up, we're looking at a, a site and basically the, and I, I tried to find it, I thought it was defined in here, but I, I didn't. I know we've talked about how the districts are listed kind of from least intense to most intense. I don't know if that was ever actually specified explicitly in there anywhere, because this talks about allowing the more intense and whatnot. There's having a note in there to address that. Um, but in this particular instance, the non-residential use is the less intense and the residential. The residential use is basically townhomes that would abut recreation. And in this particular instance, oh, yeah. you would think, well, the recreation is the more intense use. Um, you know, because you have out there banging tennis rackets, potentially lighting and other stuff. But when you look at the hierarchy of intensity of yeah. districts, the residential becomes the more mm -hmm. intense use. And we don't have to answer that today. I just thought we might want to go back and, and look at the intent of how that was worded. Well, if the marina is redoing a lot of their commercial wouldn't this come up with the buffer between that and the townhomes? Yeah, now to me, that's a clear, because you have a non-residential is also the more intense. So that's where they would have to have the buffer on their property. In this particular one, we're talking about the non-residential is the less intense mm -hmm. and the residential would be the more intense because the non-residential is recreation. So you might just want to, Look at that and make sure we have it worded. Yeah, correctly. And if you look at the the last column on the chart, um, it requires the buffer on non-residential 
uh, for non-residential uses, but the footnote says non-residential uses in the residential district. So we need to adjust that because the intent was if you, and it's unlikely to happen here, but in most communities, residential district allows churches and schools. And so the idea is even though it's zone residential, that's an intense use that should provide a buffer. Um, in, in your example, and it's, it's very appropriate, um, the recreational use wouldn't be in a residential district, it's in its own district. So we'll need to make an adjustment there. What is the, what's the qualifier for intense? What, well, what is meant by more intense or less intense? The, the, in chapter four, where we list the districts, yeah. they're intended to be listed less least intense to most intense. But and I, what, I, what, what is, what establishes intensity? The type of use in the case of residential, it's the density of use, uh, the, the lot sizes. It's usually uh, non-residential uses are gonna be more intense than residential uses. In but the we, example you gave of a, I think you said it wouldn't apply here, but in the case of a church in a residential district. Right. Okay, so the church may be used very infrequently, will be used by more people when they're having church services, and the residences will be used on a daily basis by the residential owners. So how do you judge which of those is the more intense? Well, in that example, it's because the church is going to have a large parking lot. Uh, typically, churches now are not just uh, seen activity on Sundays. They've got evening classes. They've got daycares. They've got a lot of activity going on. Uh, obviously, the same with schools. So the idea is that uh, while from a zoning standpoint, the idea of having a church or a school in a residential neighborhood is usually desirable because it contributes to the fabric of the community and, and all of that. The use itself can be a nuisance under certain con conditions. And that's why we would require a, a buffer on that use. Could it be when you do this that the person who's doing the construction be responsible for the buffer? In other words, what? When I first had this discussion with the person about this, that's what my brain defaulted to talking to him. This guy was going back and forth with me about who would be required to do the buffer. And I was like, well, it's going to be you because you're the one developing. <laughs> and then we got into this level of intensity of uses and all that. Stuff. Backed off. But if I'm, you know, if I'm someone who is, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying, but boy, it would just seem like as the person who's encroaching and building, that should be my responsibility then. Well, let's, let's take a more extreme example, which won't apply. Um, if residential district abuts an industrial district or a commercial district, um, it shouldn't be the residential developer's responsibility to put in the buffer. It's gonna be the more intense use, the industrial developer, the commercial developer, the buffer his project from the adjacent residential. Well, can't, can't we use the example that we all know is the one where the tennis court abutted the piece of property that somebody wanted to develop with townhomes? And the, that according to this, the more intense would be the townhome. If I'm looking at this. Thing That's now. correct. That yeah. would be correct. So the, the townhome would be responsible for doing the buffer, the buffer and not the tennis court. 
not, not the tennis, the recreational facility. But the tennis court is also existing though. So point being there kind of like what Dan said is no matter what though, I don't think that we could go in and tell the tennis courts, hey, they're planning on building I know. over here. By the way, by the way you, you have to put a buffer, right? Part of your yeah, exactly. Tennis court and put some vegetation in there. <laughs> <laughs> like good luck with that. That's what I was thinking. I couldn't quite. Yeah, in that case, then it becomes the residential developer's responsibility. If he is putting his project next to uh, an existing... a potentially obnoxious use, um, that use already exists. If he wants to protect his development, then he's going to have to put in the buffer. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that going that back to your example, yeah. if they're both industrial and residential, both going in at the same time, then the in the intensity argument becomes good because they're doing it concurrently. But on the flip side, if somebody's already there and then somebody wants to put something in there or whatever, those people that are doing the construction should be responsible for putting in whatever needed buffers would have to be put in. Right, it's not intended to be retroactive, okay. uh, but it's for new development coming in. If, if you're the nuisance per se, then you have to provide the, the buffer. But I agree with Joe's point regarding the, the recreational uses, yeah. uh, we can make an adjustment here to make sure that's covered. Okay, that, uh, that that would be understood. If a ball field or uh, something of that nature goes into a, a residential area, then they should be responsible for providing some buffer okay. separation. So, Help me out here because we are going to find it. This chart, I think you referred to as the chart that lists the uses in order of intensity. History. Yeah. yeah. So if, if this chart is part of the DSO, then does is there somewhere that refers to this chart that states? that the uses are ordered according to intensity. I think there is. I'll have to go back and check. I think it's in Article 4 where that chart right. is. But, John, here's the part that's in there. It's just this part, the new part. Yeah, the new part, not the old part. Not the yeah. old part. Oh, yeah, but that's the intensity that you're talking about. But, okay. but what I'm looking for is the use of the word intensity right. in connection with the chart. Because what we're saying is these are ordered according to intensity. Yeah. And if we're going to say that, then we can rely on that use of intensity or more intense, less intense with even, reference to the chart. I don't even know that we need to have all that in there. I mean, we have the table 11.3 um, where we define where a buffer is. And it's, the table is not necessarily looking at use. So the starting point is it's looking at districts. So if you above this district, regardless of what you're putting in there, if you're zoned this and you above that and it's different, you may have to put a buffer in. So for the one we're looking at, it's RTH, it abuts RC, which is recreation. So this says you need an A buffer, which is a 20 foot, and it defines when all is needed. So but who's responsible for putting it in? Whoever's developing their property. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Now, if you're from the other side, so let's say the recreation parcel abuts townhome. Going from the left, the second one down is RC recreation. Mm -hmm. It abuts townhome. There's no buffer required. So the recreational use does not have to install a buffer, but the townhome does because the townhome is the more intense land use. So regardless of who, even if the townhome was built before the tennis courts, uh, not the case in this example, but even if it was, it doesn't matter. We just look at what the property is zoned. Um, and the more intense district based on this is townhome. So the townhome would have to be but if, but if indeed, let's say what 
Jerry, when we started hours ago, was talking about what is the <clears throat> a real estate piece of property. If the club mm -hmm. takes that and makes it a recreation, <laughs> it's recreational, mm -hmm. but they put in a pool and this other stuff, it abuts some townhouse. Yes. Yeah. Now, in my mind, they would be required to put a buffer between those townhomes and that piece of property, but what we're saying here is no. So, uh, and all we might have, could have, might happen. Yeah. So, I, I think it might be better just to start as the basis from that schedule and then maybe just put certain notes or footnotes in mm -hmm. that. <laughs> if there's one not required, maybe it will be required if it's a certain type of recreational mm -hmm. use or something along those lines. Well, actually, as I look at the chart, yeah, I think I think to, to go back to your original example, there's the recreation district of Bucks yeah, and there's the residential district. No An A type buffer is required. RC abuts. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, the town and multi family that doesn't have the buffer. Yeah. But then if, uh, if that's abutting building A, if the town does it, but there's no buffer required, if, uh, mm -hmm. if they can. Yeah, and that's what would be that because the tampons are already there. Yeah. If you, if we're using the real estate, I was about to say, yeah. depends on what you're <laughs> <for. laughs> no, 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 You know. So I can we can argue both sides of this. Um, and considering that the golf course is right. I guess in my mind, where I'm going with that, the buffer should be required either way. For like in that in that instance of an RC to a to a MF, it should be. I don't understand why there's no A buffer requirement from the RC to the. Well, if, you, if you, like if it was just a passive recreational trail, um, that's well, one thing. Yeah. Is there like some? Do you, yeah. do you want to to do you want to like buffer along? Yeah, I was going to say that we're not building is, buffers is there, along the is golf course. Discretionary language that can be put in there that gives some, you know, common sense factor to the zoning administrator that just says if it's common sense, there's going to be, you know, I mean, it, clearly not this verbiage, but I'm saying <laughs> there's going to be a tennis court put in right next to a multifamily building that's completely separate ownership and everything. Common sense would say there should be some buffering between that. And that doesn't give us any wiggle room at all to ask for that. Use your common sense. Well, that doesn't give me. That doesn't give me. It has to be. It has to be written. In but common sense. common sense is my common sense. It's not your common believe, sense. So. Believe me when I say. No, my common just, sense is not what's applicable. I just got those <laughs> doing and told that everything was adjacent use setbacks and buffers. So literally, depending on what you wanted to do with the site, the buffer requirement changed regardless of the zoning. So I don't, I, I don't expect us to resolve this today. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to raise it. But it's a, a question that I, I'd like to get with Paul and just look at okay. the best way that we may want to address this and then at first reading, I expect to give you, you know, some alternate language to, to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, jumping ahead <laughs> to page 11 4, number five. We're still in the buffer. It says the, the requirements of this article, buffer requirements, may be waived or modified by the reviewing authority in accordance with the provisions of 117B, which there is not an 117B. We think it's 115B, but, <laughs> which deals with tree preservation, but um, under the following conditions. It's demonstrated there is topography or vegetation that will achieve the purpose. Don't have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. It was demonstrated that for topographic reasons, no required screening device could reasonably screen. Don't really have an issue with that. 
The third one basically gives two neighboring property owners the right by agreement to kind of waive a zoning requirement of the town. I have concerns with that. <laughs> Um, to me, I would just strike C um, that, you know, if it doesn't meet A or B, then you're basically to a variance situation. And, you know, if you can make an argument that you have some hardship and one of the criteria the Board of Zoning Appeals will look at is if there's an adverse impact to the community. And if the neighboring property owner comes in or sends a letter saying, hey, I have no objection to them mm -hmm. not putting a buffer, that's something that the Board of Zoning Appeals can take into consideration in deciding whether or not to grant a variance. So my recommendation would be to strike C. Um, you know, I, I think if we have an ordinance, we, we should be willing to enforce our ordinance, not allow two people by private agreement to supersede what that ordinance requires. Um, I, I can see the basis for it. Basically, or if they don't care, we don't care, you know, why have them, but um, just personally, I, I don't like that. Okay. Paul, do you have anything you'd want to? No, I, I don't disagree with that. I think we're just looking again for ways to uh, building flexibility without having to go through Some, uh, an administrative process. And then on page 1111, 11, which talks about permit approvals for tree removal, mm -hmm. C, um, it says applications shall only be approved if the zoning administrator determines that one of the following conditions exist. A safety hazard that's a dam. Um, if it's weakened by disease, age, storm, fire, other injury, that's a dam. Three, the location prevents the reasonable development of the property. To me, that should be board of zoning appeals. Um, that the zoning administrator should not on their own be making a determination of whether a hardship exists or not. Um, but because reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> or Tyler may not be the same as reasonable for me. For right. you. Yes. So um, I would prefer that to go the quasi judicial route. You can yeah. present your evidence, you can be questioned, people can um, support it or oppose it. And, you know, you basically have to justify it in a quasi judicial setting that it's preventing your reasonable development of the property. Um, you know, Tyler may look at it one way and say, well, you know, no, that's not reasonable. And I would look at it one way and say, well, you can just root around it and you know, you're fine or just this over here. And uh, I, I would folks prefer that. Charge to of, the, of the tree removal on every lot, or is that just yeah. outside of the gate? Outside so, of the Essentially, what it, I, I don't know what the verbiage is right now. It's currently like commercial property owners that okay. So, in theory, the club. Okay. Doing tree removal or something like that—that that would fall under our purview, um, and then anything outside of the gate. Okay. Any, all the residential properties is, are, is but yeah. I didn't think so. Um, yeah, I can see. Moving there. So I, I personally would just recommend striking that one. Um, like I said, most of the other stuff is um, going to be fairly minor. Um, one thing we, we don't have that I think we may want to yeah we may want to stick in um, we we did one with the last zoning ordinance I worked with when we had to have a meeting with the Department of Justice having some language in there about reasonable accommodation um, I don't think we have that I, I, we could use the same exact language that I've used in the past. Um, Basically, under federal law, you have to have a, a mechanism to grant reasonable accommodation if it's due to a physical or mental handicap. Um, we did not when I was in Fort Mill. It had to go through a variance. A physical handicap is not one of the criteria the board can take into consideration. The board denied the variance. The complaint was made to Department of Justice, and we ended up changing our ordinance to provide a a mechanism for reviewing reasonable accommodation requests. So I would recommend we stick something like that in there, 
We'll find a spot, but it's somewhere. In 11, somewhere. somewhere. Okay. No, it wouldn't be in 11. It would be either a general provision. Oh, or okay. We'd, we'd put it elsewhere in the world. Okay. Uh, I do think we need something more for that. Okay. Which makes sense. I just was curious where you were sticking. Um, so those were some of the ones that I had. I, I know there will be others when we get to first reading. Um, those are some of the, the more substantial ones. But um, uh, I know you've had a, a couple months now with this document in your possession and a couple weeks with the most recent version. Are there, I know we had already talked about um, Can I just bring one other thing up here? Yes. When we're in the 11 area here, why do we go from 11 9 to page 11 11? Did something happen? Is that that section? Mm -hmm. First, I thought my printer didn't print it, but now it's no, it does there. go from 11 10 is missing. I didn't know whether we removed something. No, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, there is no 1110. Yeah. Uh, Just want to point that out. I mean, out it looks like it goes, the, it, it, the it, outline goes. It actually, it flows right, but I didn't know what had happened. I, at first, I thought my printer didn't print it. It was a test to see if you would pick it up. If I would, okay. <laughs> I'll blame it on the word processing. Not the word processing. <laughs> So I know we already got one question about commercial recreational uses and recreational districts. Um, we'll verify, I don't remember right offhand, that the minimum lot acreage is based on high ground or total lot I, I looked at that uh, earlier. The definition applies to uh, net and gross density. When we say net density uh, only applies to high ground, it does not refer to minimum lot area. Uh, but I did note that in the residential district table uh, where we specified uh, minimum lot size, despite the minimum lot size, there's also a density limit for each of the residential districts. So in our S uh, SFR2, uh, even though it, it requires a minimum 17,500 square feet, it only allows two lots per acre. And in uh, RSF3, where we allow 7,500 square foot lots, presumably that would get us almost five lots. Uh, I think it only allows uh, to, I, that number may be incorrect, but anyway, there's a limit on the number of units per acre, regardless of the lot size. Okay. So, uh, but to answer your original question, the lot can contain marshlands. Okay. And so they can count that as, even though they can't build on it. They well, they can count it, but they still have to have a building envelope that meets all the setback requirements and would accommodate a, a, a dwelling. Okay. So you can't have a lot that's 100% marsh um, mm -hmm. and go to the Board of Appeals and say, well, I've got a hardship on our build there. I mean, that technically wouldn't meet any of the, the requirements for variance. Okay. And presumably when the, the subdivision is presented for approval. Uh, the town is going to look at those lots and say, well, these won't be legitimate lots because they're covered by marshes. Uh, we've got to move your lot lines. And, 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 and some of that is happening right now. I have a neighbor across the street who owns a lot next door, and through years, it's on the marsh. The marsh has moved up into that lot. I mean, so um, it's a fairly small lot, but I, I, I don't know whether or not, I don't know if you can count all that, you still have to have, 
if the marsh is coming up more, you have to be set back from that marsh. Right. And so you have to deal with all those setbacks right. within your, right. your thing. The, the lot itself is plenty big enough, but right. what's buildable has deteriorated. I think it's a 25 foot setback from the, the marsh okay. uh, and other environmental features. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and we have the one comment about trash receptacles. Um, I've already Tyler in here when we were having a discussion. Just get that out of there. So, what um, are there things in there that you've come across that you don't like or have questions about, or anything that's not in there that you feel should be in there? It's only 200 some pages. I expect I, I don't know, yeah, I mean, really, yeah, right. A couple places I circled in your questions. Some of these like, trees yeah. I'm not sure about, but. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I <laughs> don't know what's supposed to do. The deer eat them. I know the deer eat these. <laughs> deer eat them. <laughs> so don't, don't put them out there. No. Did the camp's kitchen fall under the accessory yeah. uses and structure thing? Or is that the thing? Yeah, I looked up the definition of accessory here. It's basically, it basically says accessories and accessories. Yeah, but that, that zoning. Is allowed. I just want to make sure a lot of all those things are allowed in the yeah. kitchen lately, and I just want to make sure that everything's have they gotten kosher. put back together the kitchen? I don't know. Okay. I know that they have a temporary trailer. I know they do. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a temporary trailer. We have a temporary fridge as well. Should we revisit the temporary use permit? <laughs> so they don't have to keep coming in every that was just be terrible. Personally, what is it? How well, long currently they have to come in every every sixty days to get reapproved by town council to to keep extending their. And what does it say in the new date? That well, I don't know what it says in this. Is it so personally? I think that for those extensions, they should be able to just come back to the staff level. As long as it didn't become I mean, excessive, you know. Right. Four years later, four maybe, years maybe, maybe that's X amount of extension so we can come back for the staff level before. That's my wife's story. Okay. So, Joe, <coughs> on, uh, sorry, this is on page 12 6. Okay. At paragraph number two in the second line. Looks like you have S C D E A C. And I I can't find what S C D E A C is. So I'm guessing that should have been S C D heck. Where is it? So on page 12 6, paragraph number two, which is at the top of that page. Drainage, second line, yeah. S-C-D-E-A-C, which yeah. I think should be yeah. S-C-D-H-E-C. Yeah, but it, it, since it refers to engineering standards, I wasn't sure about that. <coughs> Thank you. 
on page 11-6 in paragraph D, subparagraph one, subdivisions, sub subparagraph A, sub 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 paragraph I. It says development, town, town, <laughs> subdivision, town. I wasn't sure what that was. I don't know that one. That's a new type of subdivision. Yes. I don't know. know. Development town or town? It's, those are the ones that I have marked so far. So, Joe, I did have a question on. Um, Page two, three. And we're talking at the very top about light sources shall not be aimed at adjoining properties, streets, beaches, or upward. How does that impact landscape lighting that is like aimed up into the tree? Again, I guess that's not inside the gate because that is dealt with in the ARC. Mm -hmm. That's true because you get it approved. Yeah, Your lighting plan out. has to be approved for residents. So that would just be for anything outside. Anything outside. But still, we, 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 do, some, we do some up lights at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just seems so like black and white when you talk about landscape. But you, you again, so you want them dark sky. Is there any place in there that says dark sky? We don't, you know. I'm, I'm like just saying. Going straight up, they're bouncing against the tree. But. Well, still. Yeah. Well, uh, paragraph D, accent lighting does something to address what you're talking about. I mean, accent if you put enough. Oh, yeah, accent lighting. Okay. okay. If you put enough lights close to where it opens up to the okay, marsh yeah. or by the old back building or much think, light I on the it, marsh. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think the accent lighting is just, uh, just definitely it's still just a little bit of conflict because you read the general and then. Yeah, like I said, the residents pretty, I mean, talk about lumens and candle. Yeah, I mean, I mean it really they gets really into the nitty gritty. Yeah. And, uh, and every light fixture outside has good news. So, um, but they supersede this. So, not necessarily. Well, and. You can tell when the low responses say 128 points because everybody comes in. 
Seed mm -hmm. egg, not to exceed 60 days, and then two additional periods of 30 days. So, technically speaking, they wouldn't be allowed to do what they're currently doing. Oh, flip candles. Is there any objection if we, we took the temporary use provisions on 18.3 and kind of made them more of a flexible, primarily staff review? I think, okay. Yes. Yeah. Maybe like if it's over six months, then it goes to planning commission and council. But wow. like the zoning administrator could do like three months. I would say even even over three months. I was going to say hundred. Maybe hundred and eighty days. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say just a few months because I mean once you are going past, I'd say three months or so, you are kind of entering a weird territory. No, 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 I'm going back to the lighting. Oh, lighting. In terms of whether or not it's temporary. Like a three month initial, a three month renewal. And then if it's beyond that, then if they're wanting to do it for more than six months, it has to go to planning commission and council. That's what I said, 180, I think 180 days, and then it goes to, then it has to go to, because that's not temporary. Anymore. Right. Now you've moved into, because most of what's coming in, I mean, it's just rubber stamp stuff. I mean, there's no yeah. Every other temporary no use permit that we've gotten has been in that what seventy-two hours or less. Yeah, I mean, like the, they haven't done it in a couple of years, but the billfish is usually yeah you know, two events over seven to ten days or something. It's like nobody's going to question or object to the billfish tournament. I mean, yeah. Why does that have to go through the planning commission and council? everything else? Yeah. Just kind of busy work. Hey, Jim, going back to the lighting again, um, and that's F. That is everything outside the gate. Which favor? Two, two. Two, two. Two, two. Two, two. Two, two. I think we should have something in there that's, I mean, I see where you say parking lots and so on. I mean, are you talking about parking lots at the club and so on? I mean, which is right on the ocean. You should, you should put stuff in there about dark sky. I mean, the, you know, Policy, the policies and procedures for Sapoa deal with this extensively. And every time that something goes on, they really look at this. I mean, are you going to really? Yeah, I agree that, you know, that's what I'm saying, if it's outside. Yeah. You got marsh areas that, again, we don't want lights. I mean, that's different from the general requirement that they have to be hooded or shielded to prevent glare and light spill. Well, that's that's going down. It should not. It has nothing. Dark sky means it's not going to be shown going up. It's a whole bunch of uh, dark sky compliant lights approval. You could just say that lighting needs to be dark sky compliant. That's all. Um, it says they shall not be aimed at adjoining property, streets, beaches, or upward. Hmm. I guess the curtail and reverse degradation of nighttime environment and the night sky, that's basically what dark sky compliant does. But the point is, if you go and you buy lights, I know we bought them 10 years ago for our house. 
all our outside lights were, we, we just said to the lighting contractor, you have to be dark sky compliant, period, the end. It's a very easy way to. Yeah, that's sort of like a industry standard, it looks like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And basically, they are hooded lights. Um, exactly. They, they get you what you want. Yeah. I'm just saying it's just understood if you're going to a light contractor or to somebody building and you say, this is the type of lights we want or require. But is that a standard or a term of art? I think it you looks like it's a standard. I'm not, that is dark Did you ever mention that in the, in the POA? Yeah. Um, and it's everything goes down. Everything. Yeah. Take a look at that potentially. Um, I don't know whether there's outdoor lighting yeah. basics. I mean, international they have, dark but they have a more, they have a, a, a lot more. So, um, the only one we needed, only light area that needs it, be no brighter than necessary, necessary minimize blue light emissions, be fully shielded, pointing downward. Uh, and this is from the International Dark Sky Association. Who are they? You know, that's just lights. You know. So I'm just saying you can look at outdoor lighting and, and get dark sky compliant lighting. But for around here, dark where light pollution is a problem, it's. Uh, I don't know if it's a problem, it's more of a, an we're issue. We're in the International Dark Sky Week. Yeah. We're in International Dark Sky Week right now. No, that was in April, I thought it said. Oh, April, well, then we, okay, we're it's March. March, please. <laughs> I only wish it was I'll rush my life for one. And we need people. Every time we change lighting requirements, this is where we want it for the most part. It's the idea. Joe, one question I had jotted down was more and more LSEs and electric cars in, in, in the parking discussion. We really don't talk about what happens if somebody wants to put charging stations in or solar panels to provide the energy for the charging or whatever? I mean, is that something we should address? I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get the committee to what? require. That's what I was going to say. Make it a, that was a requirement to build it. Any new development, any new commercial development. Yeah, you, you have a charging. Yeah, just one singular phone. You had yeah. EV charging station. I, I tried to get that in, but they wouldn't go for it. So we settled for bike parking. But <laughs> I think you should put it in. It's, I mean, it's certainly something that's going to be your an issue that's going to grow. Well, that's what I was, I mean, I remember when I first started with Hilton Head, I thought that it was kind of, we would get a lot of pushback on it. And I remember thinking to myself that it was kind of a silly requirement. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, uh, just for example, like I had a guy who built an airport hangar that was behind a gate. It was his private airplane hangar. And he had to put a charging. And he had to put an EV charging station in. And he had to put a bike rack in. <laughs> <laughs> but well, but the point being is, it's looking towards the future. He had a plane. Where, EV, where e e e uh, electronic vehicles likely are going to yeah. eventually become a well, lot more. That costly. seems like it could be overkill. But I can see if you have like a minimum of. 20 parking spaces. When they redo, when they redo Bohemian Marina, are they thinking about putting in charging stations? We haven't gotten that far. But I'm just saying, if we have it as a requirement, I mean, if we have it as a requirement and they redo the parking lot, they have to. Yeah. I mean, so many, you know, charging stations per parking spot, or whatever. I'm not sure because of some of the hassles that we've had. On Sapoa with, with um, solar panels mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. 
I don't know if you'd want to put EV stations that are, you know, make them hardwired into the this. Yeah, the solar panels. Um, because they do build like arbors with yes, solar panels. Yes, yes, I've on, seen that. And then that's where you plug in yep. the solar panels. And maybe if it's not, because the only thing that we've dealt with on the ARC level was that it wasn't, um, couldn't see it from the street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More of an aesthetic. Yeah. Right. It's all about aesthetics. Yeah. So if you put in a bunch of solar panels that are just out there for an EV station, that's going to mm -hmm. be creating a, an issue. But and if I, it's part of the top. And I guess, uh, too, I'm thinking the design standard. Yes. This is the DSO of what, I mean, we're prescribing what poles and stuff look like. What should a charging place look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these new technology things. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay, no. I, you know, I worry, Joe, when 5G comes, which is supposed to, there's going to be a bunch of cans around uh, all the poles or somehow. It's not that go to the top of the tower and put up these types of, um, yeah. Uh, and the thing is, our community Climbers for top of the line technology, uh, you know, high speed internet, whatever. We hear we heard, heard it all the time. So the, the, the telecom lobby is very strong, and we've already been putting in on that. So, yeah. so I was going to say, I think we had five G. Yeah, we already we get five G up here. Oh really? Yeah, I just tested it. You do get five G. Yeah, they put I guess I better on the get because I, I looked on the map. Who, who's your provider? Verizon. Oh, okay. The map doesn't come out here. It's a, maybe a 5G light, not full 5G. It said 5G. Okay. Usually when it switches, it goes to LTE, but right now it just sits there. Okay. What do you got, Mr. Mayor? Because uh, um, well, I, I, when it comes to technology, I defer to you. This is uh, this. I think I guess we know. Does it matter? I don't even know. You have to open your flip phone. Yeah. Yeah. We switched. We just switched. You have to have. We were last. Okay, so how do you figure that's, that's it out? Like so, teenager, so. I know, <laughs> the way that you figure it out, so you have to turn off your Wi-Fi, right? And then at the top of your screen where it usually yeah, it says, says like 4G. Mine says 4G because I don't have a phone that's capable of 5G. Yeah. I have to, you know, I that's know. another caveat. You have to have a 5G capable plan and a phone. Okay. Extras. <laughs> the extras have always run up the charges. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What, what was that? What was that you were saying about residents out here being all about the high tech? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, then. So, oh, better bandwidth. It sounds like uh, we've concluded our Can business. Jerry, do you have anything further? <laughs> Sometimes I feel picked on. <laughs> um, no, I have nothing. Thank further. you, Pat. Anything further? I have nothing further. Thank you, Dan. Anything further? You really want to know? No, <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Okay, in that case, Gary's not here, so I will now be happy to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Thank you. All in favor of adjournment, please right. signify your approval by saying aye. 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 So I have preempted you, and now we're adjourned. Are we turned off uh, momentarily? Stop screen sharing.